2. Now a hearing on the health insurance industry. We'll hear about a practice called post-claims underwriting, where an insurance company cancels an individual policy after that person submits an expensive claim. Henry Waxman of California chairs the Oversight Committee. This is about two hours, 45 minutes. Committee will please come to order. I, uh, first of all, want to, uh, uh, as, a, uh, as a chairman of the committee, welcome our newest member, Representative Jackie Speer, who represents the 12th District of California. Rep Representative Speer, uh, uh, we're very pleased to have her on our committee. She is very experienced as a state legislator, and I want to acknowledge the fact that she's now a member of the committee. The, um, today's hearing begins what I hope will be a series of hearings into how the market for individual health insurance policies work. The individual health insurance market serves approximately 14 million Americans. Some members of Congress cite the individual market as a model for national health insurance reform, yet the business practices of the companies that sell individual health insurance policies have never been closely examined by the Congress. Today's hearing will examine a little-known business practice in the individual health insurance market, which the industry calls post-claims underwriting. Post Post-claims underwriting is a sanitized name for an exceptionally offensive practice, retroactively denying health insurance to people who get sick and when they get sick. Most Americans who have health insurance get that insurance through their employers or through government programs like Medicare or Medicaid or TRICARE. Americans who are fortunate enough to have group insurance are not at risk for post-claims underwriting. Group insurance coverage can't be terminated when you need it the most. Americans who purchase health insurance in the individual market face a very different situation. In most states, insurers require applicants for individual health insurance to fill out detailed application forms that are designed to identify any physical or mental health condition or chronic illness. Insur insurers are supposed to then look at the application provided on these forms before approving the applicant for coverage. Based on this information, the insurer decides whether to issue the policy, to issue the policy with certain restrictions, such as refusing to cover pre-existing uh, conditions, or to deny the application altogether. This process is called medical underwriting, and the expectation is that it will occur before the policy is issued or denied. Post-claims underwriting happens after the individual health insurance company has decided to approve a policy and to issue that policy. It is often triggered after the policyholder gets sick or has an accident and requires major health insurance uh, coverage to be put into place to pay for the bills. The insurer then goes back and then goes with a fine tooth comb through the insurance application to see if there's any technicality that can be used to justify rescinding the policy. This happened to two of our witnesses, Heidi and Keith Blazard. They will tell us how their health insurance was taken away after Heidi suffered serious injuries in a biking accident. Their insurer regents claimed that Heidi and Keith made a mistake in their application for health insurance, and then they terminated, the insurance company terminated the policy. They were left with more than $100,000 in medical bills. What happened to the Blazers is inexcusable. The reason families buy insurance is so that they will be covered when they get sick. But regions cancel their insurance when they needed it the most. Unfortunately, the experience of the Blazers is not an isolated one. We'll hear today that over 1,000 individuals in California had their insurance policies inappropriately rescinded. And we'll hear about policyholders in Connecticut 
who suffered the same thing. One person who was terminated because the insurer said he should have known that his occasional headaches would later be diagnosed as multiple sclerosis. I understand that insurance companies need to protect themselves from fraud, but that is not what happened in California, Connecticut, or across the country. Insurers are using technicalities or trumped up misrepresentations to rescind policies after individuals get sick and accumulate hundreds of thousands of dollars in medical bills. Now that may be a great deal for the insurance companies. They can pocket the premiums while the families are well and then cancel the coverage if anyone in the family gets seriously sick. But it defeats the whole point of getting an insurance policy in the first place. While state regulators are the front line of defense for consumers, the federal government is the last line. Under HIPAA, the Federal Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996, consumers are guaranteed the right to renew their individual health insurance policies unless they have defrauded the insurer or intentionally misrepresented their medical condition. Unfortunately, few consumers know of their federal HIPAA rights to guarantee renewability. That's because the federal agency responsible for enforcing HIPAA, the Centers for Medicare and uh, Medicaid Services, has done nothing to enforce those rights or to ensure that states do so. Of its 4,387 full-time employees, only four are assigned to administering HIPAA. CMS has never taken any action against any health insurer for post-claims underwriting that violates a consumer's HIPAA rights. Our hearing today will examine how the practice of post-claims underwriting is being abused to deny coverage to ailing Americans. We will learn what some state regulators are doing to stop the abuses, and we'll ask why the federal government is doing nothing to protect consumers from this practice. And we'll ask the Health Insurance Industries Trade Association why insurers in the individual market do post-claims underwriting and why it has taken the intervention of regulators to bring an end to this unfair practice in some states. These are not academic questions. Discussions are already underway about how the next Congress might best ensure that all Americans have adequate health care coverage. Some health care reform proposals would move millions of Americans, including many of those now insured through their employers, and billions of federal dollars into the health insurance market. This would obviously be a radical change in our health care system, whether it represents reform is a debate for another day. To prepare for that debate, however, we all need a much better understanding of the individual health insurance market as it currently functions. The purpose of this hearing is to begin that educational uh, process. And I now want to recognize Mr. Issa for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I would like to have uh I ask unanimous consent to have principles for ensuring fair and appropriate practices for individual market policy rescissions and pre-existing conditions clauses entered into the record at this time. Without objection, that will be the order. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, getting individual insurance can be difficult in a marketplace. The marketplace clearly favors risk allocated or apportioned over large groups. Losing individual coverage retroactively can put one's life at risk. I believe that is the reason for this, uh, this hearing today. I think it is an incredibly important reason uh, for the uh, blizzards uh, who are here today, and we will get it better, the pronunciation better as we go on, I am sure. Uh, you have our deepest sympathy. Clearly, mistakes happen, wrongdoing can occur, and we are here today to try to separate both of those. Uh, from the legitimate practice of, of looking for fraud in applications. Undoubtedly, I am sure you will agree in testimony that all three exist. People make mistakes, people defraud insurance companies, and insurance companies make mistakes or use practices in some cases that are clearly wrong and self-serving. So I appreciate the committee covering this. Although HIPAA's jurisdiction is extremely limited and 
the administration of both President Clinton and now President Bush have seen fit to see little or no uh, federal wrongdoing, that doesn't stop this committee from seeing whether, in fact, two administrations have been wrong and perhaps create an, an opportunity for the next administration to get it right. Certainly, uh, the, our, te our uh, witnesses today from California and Connecticut will be very helpful. It is very clear that although people who are victims or alleged victims of misconduct by health insurance carriers are important to hear from, it is also important to hear from as many people who are advocates or responsible for administering the fair, the fair use of, of these opportunities on both sides. Only State regulators have primary jurisdiction. Their goal, the goal of the people of California, Connecticut and all of our States, is in fact to guarantee consumers the contract sanctity necessary in a health care arrangement. Consumers clearly need access, more access to and more awareness to this, pro this growing problem that an individual health care application could in fact retroactively be denied. It is not uncommon when people are filling out applications for people quite, quite harmlessly to gloss over or not take time to mention that they had an injury or an illness decades earlier. That clearly should not allow a, tech, a technical uh, and unrelated cancellation to occur. We have an industry in America that is under considerable assault with rising cost and limited ability for individuals or even companies to pay. I join with the Chairman in recognizing that uh, with 44 plus million uninsured Americans, the last thing we need to do is to have people doubting whether it is worthwhile to get insurance to begin with. Very clearly, unless people can, count, can count on contract sanctity, it is likely that we would only uh, increase the number of people who choose to put the money into a savings account or spend it rather than make that investment against the rainy day occurrence of an illness or injury. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, as we talked earlier at this time, I uh, would like to ask unanimous consent to have our witness from the third panel, so closely related to the industry and to the regulators, Stephanie uh, Kenwit, uh, be allowed to be on the first panel because we believe that it is the only way to have a fair back and forth during uh, the evaluation and it will save a considerable amount of time. Uh, this suggestion that you are making and requesting by unanimous consent is one that we have discussed. And uh, as we looked at uh, organizing this hearing, we think we have organized it in a way that is fair to everyone and will give everyone an opportunity to speak. Uh, we could put everybody on one panel, but uh, CMS didn't want to be on with the State regulators, which might have made some sense. Uh, the insurance companies uh, are going to be, trade association are going to be on afterwards. I don't see why they have to be on uh, this panel. And since uh, we've, we have always tried to accommodate the uh, minority and staff in uh, witness recommendations and in structuring the hearings. But w our best judgment is we have structured it uh, the way it uh, makes the most sense. Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, since the UC is not agreed to and since the minority disagrees at this time that uh, this is by any means fairness since there are uh, obviously a, a slanting in the first two panels by the majority and our one witness has been relegated to the last panel, uh, I would hereby make a motion that we move Stephanie uh, Kenwit to the first panel at this time. Is your witness the insurance company? Is I'm that why you are here? No. To it, protect it, it, the insurance company? Why don't we hear about this problem? And also as a Californians, hear from the California uh, regulators who I think we ought to be proud of having done the right thing. They represent a Republican governor. Let's, let's hear from the witnesses and not go through a, a procedural motion. I would urge the uh, gentleman not to try to pursue a, a motion to rearrange the committee uh, hearing list. I understand your point. You, you've made a point. Uh, but it, I, it's the prerogative of the chairman to decide the, the order of the witnesses. And uh, we always welcome input. And in fact, I think we've been more responsive to the input uh, from the minority than when we were in the minority. 
Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, we, uh, we did talk about the other alternative, which would be to have the State regulators, including California, who is considering some of these reforms that the Association representative will be talking about uh, on the same panel, and you also declined that. Uh, so at, at this time, uh, I must reiterate my motion uh, to combine uh, the third and first panel. I don't know whether it's appropriate even to entertain such a motion. Uh, let me uh, have our council review that and advise me. I've never, I have never in my 34 years in the Congress ever had a member or seen a member make a motion to stop a hearing for witnesses uh, by asking that they be rearranged in different panels or in different positions. I've never seen it. It's the first time. I think it's quite inappropriate because we're trying to get the witnesses the opportunity to be heard. Members of the committee have not been informed that there may be motions before us today. This is a hearing and not a committee meeting. I will uh, I'll recess for a second and, and consult. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. recognize himself in opposition to this motion. I think it's quite uh, outrageous to make a motion on the basis that the insurance company is being relegated to an inability to make their case because they're the last ones to speak. I think what we need is to have a, um, an opportunity to hear all the witnesses. And it's the prerogative of the chair to, fig to f uh, make this uh, determination. I think we have acted fairly. And so I uh, would urge members to vote against the motion. Uh, speaking in favor, Mr. Chairman, and I will be brief. Insurers and their representative trade association have answers to many of the questions. Regulators have questions to be answered. The banter between the two was not an, uh, a hypothetical request, but in fact one that I believe very strongly would promote a better dialogue. Uh, the prerogative of the chair in, under the House rules and the committee rules is, is relatively limited. The ability of the majority to, by vote, uh, do what they want to do is pretty absolute. Today we make this request mostly because, in fact, your party uh, said that you wanted to come together. Our party did lose the last election. We want to work with you. This is not an adversarial hearing, and it should not become one. This is a hearing in which we are trying to find ways to fix a real problem. We have real people here who were adversely affected on it, by it. The regulators that are here today are here with hypothetical and proposed answers in order to keep this from happening in the future, and they will in many cases need legislation and perhaps Federal help to do so. The insurance association representative that we chose to have here, we want them to be answerable for this practice and we want them to be part of any solution. That is necessary in our free market. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you did mention that you thought the motion was not in order. I might remind you that when you were in the major minority, you made motions for subpoenas or threatened to make motions for subpoenas at hearings like this. This is an opportunity, a scheduled opportunity. We are all given notice that, uh, that in fact, a hearing and subjects related to the hearing may very well be brought up. Mr. Chairman, I very much believe that we should look to redo this panel to make it more equitable and more effective. I'm happy to work with you on any compromise, but I don't believe that we were properly uh, recognized in the process of finding an acceptable panel that would be beneficial to all the individuals who are going to spend their time on the dais here and for those individuals and representatives who are here today uh, to give uh, testimony and be questioned. The gentleman has made his case. The issue before us is a motion to rearrange the panels. All those in favor of the motion offered by the gentleman from California, Mr. Issa, will say aye. Aye. All those opposed will say no. No. The no's have it and the motion is not agreed to. Mr. Chairman, on that I ask. And Mr. Chairman, on that I have to ask for the yeas and nays. All those in favor of the yeas and nays, raise your hand. An insufficient yes. number I and the motion uh, request for a roll call is not granted. 
Now Ms. We I, will Mr. Chairman, I, I appeal the uh, ruling of the chair. You, you would go that far to keep us from even hearing these witnesses because you're worried that we won't be here to hear the insurance company. Well, we won't even get to the insurance company if you drag out this hearing. Mr. Chairman, I do not want to drag out the hearing. Uh, I will at this time. Those in favor of, a, of overruling the decision of the chair will say aye. Aye. Those opposed will say no. Aye. No. The noes have it. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I am mad. I ask for the yeas and nays. All those in favor of a roll call vote, raise your hand. An insufficient number. The request is not granted. Now we will uh, hear from our witnesses. The, um, the uh, committee will receive testimony from Heidi and Keith Blazard, who are from Logan, Utah. They had their health insurance policy retroactively rescinded by Regents Blue Cross Blue Shield of Utah after Heidi was in a serious biking accident. They will explain the circumstances and consequences surrounding the rescission of their insurance coverage. Dale Bonner is Secretary of the Business, Transportation and Housing Agency for the State of California. Mr. Bonner was appointed by Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger in March of 2007 and oversees 13 departments, including the Department of Managed Health Care. He will testify about the actions his agency has taken to help consumers who had their health insurance inappropriately rescinded. Cindy Enos is the Director of the Department of Managed Health Care, was initially listed as a witness, but she was unable to appear this morning because she is in negotiations with two remaining large plans, Anthem Blue Cross and Blue Shield of California, on this issue. Mr. Bonner is accompanied today by Amy Dobertine, Chief of Enforcement Division of the Department of Managed Health Care, and Kevin Limbo heads the Office of the Health Care Advocate for the State of Connecticut in his role as Connecticut's lead advocate for patients and their families. Mr. Limbo will discuss Connecticut's experience with health insurance rescissions and what steps Connecticut has taken to aid policyholders and prevent uh, future rescissions. It is the policy of this committee uh, that all witnesses that testify before us do so under oath. So I would like to ask all of you, if you would, to please stand and raise your right hand. Do you uh, solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. The record will indicate that each of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Um, Mr. Blazard, why don't we start with you and your wife and uh, uh, have you uh, speak to us. There is a button on the base of the mic which you have to push in to turn the mic on and we're, we want to um, welcome you to the committee and express our appreciation for your willingness to be here. Well, hello, my name is Heidi Blasen. The, the, the button on the mic needs to be pressed and pull it closer so we can hear you. Can you hear me? Um, my name is Heidi Blazard and I'm here with my husband Keith Blazard to testify about the problems we had with Regents Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Utah rescinding our health insurance coverage. In February of 2005, Keith and I decided we wanted to get an individual health insurance policy for ourselves. We had two friends who are insurance agents, Doug Thatcher and Troy Delaire. Keith had known them for over 10 years. We met with them a few times and filled out applications for health and life insurance and a nurse came out to complete more detailed paperwork. On one of the forms, Keith marked that he had a history of back trouble but wasn't sure what to write in the comment section on the back. We consulted with Doug who knew all about Keith's back history having similar difficulties with his own back. Over the years and quite recently, they discussed and compared those similarities including medicines and doctor visits. After discussing Keith's back, Doug Thatcher, one of our agents, wrote in the application that Keith had, I quote, slip disc and back, had surgery 1996, full recovery, close quote. Doug assured us the paperwork was filled out satisfactorily and we trusted his knowledge of what information the insurance company needed. Keith had surgery in 1996 for a herniated disc and went three years without any pain or trouble of any kind. Later, Keith pulled his back playing basketball and developed back pain that his doctor helped him control the medicine. He has since then carried on his normal active life, including his job and floor covering, involving hard physical labor, a wide variety of rigorous activities such as hockey, snowmobiling, and being an active member of a search and rescue team. The medicine and doctor visits were detailed by the nurse on another form. 
We thought all the forms were being used together with our medical records, which we signed a release for the insurance companies to use to make their decisions. We received a letter in March of 2005 from Regents indicating that our application had been accepted and we had health insurance coverage. On August 18th, 2005, I was in a bad mountain biking accident. I broke my neck in two places in my back and five. I had a pulmonary contusion of three broken ribs and a brain injury. Search and rescue got me to where I could be life led to a trauma center. They placed me in an intensive care unit. I had to have several hours of neurosurgery on my spine. When I got out of the hospital, I had to stay in a rehabilitation unit until I was good enough to go home. My medical bills were over $100,000. In November, just when the scope of the bills was becoming apparent, Regents notified us they would be looking into our medical records. Then in January 2006, Regents notified Keith and I that they were rescinding our health insurance policy retroactively. They claimed that Keith failed to provide information in the application about his back. Regents did not respond to our attempt to talk with them to find out where the misunderstanding came from. Troy Delair, the senior agent, also attempted to clear things up with the Regents, communicating to them we had no intention of misleading them. Regents had accepted the claims and paid for Keith's medicines and doctor visits without any problem for most of a year. Having signed the release of records at the time of our application and being open to the agents and the nurse, we had no reason to suspect Regents was missing any information. Only after the bills from my accident were mounting did they notify us of a problem. Later we learned that they had not received the nurse's report detailing Keith's pain mess and doctor visits and went to life insurance only, and that these things should have been included on the form that Doug had helped us fill out. Had Regents returned a copy of our application with our health care policy as prescribed by law at the time of our acceptance, we would have had the opportunity to question where the rest of the paperwork was and perhaps avoid the future confusion. I hope insurance companies such as Regents will be prohibited from rescinding insurance coverage without making a thorough inquiry into the facts and circumstances surrounding the application of the insurance. In our situation, was completely inadequate to simply look at the application and compare it to Keith's medical records. Had Regents understood all of the facts, I do not believe they would have felt it was appropriate to retroactively cancel our coverage. I thank you for the opportunity to appear before this committee to provide information about our circumstances. Keith and I are hardworking, responsible citizens. We have never had any trouble with our creditors before this time or with the law. I believe that Regents has taken advantage of the situation to avoid paying the large medical bills for my biking accident. Any help that you can provide in making sure that these unethical practices do not continue in the future would be most appreciated. Thank you very much. Mr. Blazer, did you have anything to say or was that uh, for both of you? No, that was pretty much uh, yeah. what we prepared as far as the uh, outline of, of uh, our rescission. Okay, thank you. I'm pleased you're here. And, and when we get to questions, you may want to respond to them. Mr. Bonner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee. I'm Dale Bonner, Secretary of California's Business, Transportation, and Housing Agency. Uh, some years ago, I was the HMO regulator in the state of California, and now as uh, Secretary, I oversee the Department of Managed Health Care and uh, a number of other regulatory departments. With me is Amy, uh, Amy Dobertine, Chief of the Department's Enforcement Division. She'll be happy to answer any specific questions that you may have about uh, the law or specific enforcement actions. Um, we appreciate the opportunity to be here this morning to help shed light on what um, you in your, in your opening comment noted is a very troubling practice uh, occurring in California and we're sure uh, across the nation. By way of background, we started getting aggressive in this area in 2006 when we saw a number of uh, complaints, consumer complaints, and an increase in litigation. And so the department initiated what probably has been the largest investigation of uh, this practice in the nation, looking at the uh, five largest um, plans that provide the most individual coverage in California. That would be Anthem, Blue Cross, Blue Shield of California, Kaiser, Pacific Air, and HealthNet. And we think that um, since we started uh, getting involved, uh, we have seen dramatic changes in industry practices. Uh, we've seen about an 81 percent drop in rescissions just in the first year alone. And we have continued to focus on the area because, as uh, was noted earlier, this is a particularly harsh 
practice uh, that affects individuals because unlike uh, having your insurance policy canceled, which just means that uh, you have no coverage going forward, in this case, uh, rescission results in the entire uh, withdrawal of your coverage even going back. And so you, it leaves the member, in many cases, uh, in limbo relative to existing or ongoing uh, treatment and also uh, at risk of uh, being, in some cases, bankrupt um, as a result of substantial legal bills going back in time. And so we have continued to, to focus on these uh, practices uh, intensely. We don't um, deny that health plans have uh, the right and, in, in fact, the responsibility to uh, take a look and try to police um, inaccurate statements and applications and to make sure that uh, everything is appropriate. But we have been concerned about um, what appeared to us to be little or no consistency in their processes or procedures for investigating uh, these issues in, um, of medical history and determining whether to rescind coverage. The uh, Department's investigations and actions to date have included a total of about $3.1 million in fines. And we have uh, brought about a number of procedural changes in health plan practices. And we have, um, have achieved a significant rollback in a number of rescissions. Working with our State Attorney General and Department of Insurance, uh, we have been able to work with the industry in making sure that insurance, the uh, applications are much more transparent and that everyone has a much more clear understanding of what's required uh, in the upfront review process. A final point that, um, or a couple of final points, one is that in April of this year, the department announced that we were going to take the issue a little bit further and actually go back and review each and every individual case um, that was in fact rescinded dating back to 2004. And uh, that announcement prompted a number of the plans to come forward and uh, offer settlements. We achieved uh, successful settlements with Kaiser, HealthNet, and Pacific Care. And those settlements uh, specify that the previously rescinded enrollees will be guaranteed uh, coverage. The pre-rescission out-of-pocket medical expenses will be uh, reimbursed or paid by the plan. And additional compensatory damages can be gained uh, in arbitration or private litigation if the member so desires. Unfortunately, uh, there are two of the major plans that we have yet to achieve some settlement with to date. That's Anthem Blue Cross and Blue Shield of California. Together, they have about 2,200 cases of rescission um, b between them. And if, the, if we are not able to uh, achieve settlements in those cases, then we will go forward and review each and every case. And um, we think that, of course, we would prefer not to have that result. But if, that's, uh, if we're not successful, there could uh, be very substantial fines that would be um, imposed in each of, to, against each of those plans. But in summary, we think our aggressive action in California has achieved uh, significant improvements in the industry, certainly in the state and maybe in other states, because we have um, brought an end to this very unfair and illegal practice. We have ensured that consumers uh, have a much better understanding of what's uh, required on the application at the intake, uh, of the point of intake. We have been very successful in restoring coverage for a substantial number of enrollees who have had their um, uh, coverage unfairly rescinded in the middle of care. We think it's a good thing that we have been able to avoid uh, lengthy litigation between consumers and health plans. And more importantly, we have uh, restored some measure of faith in the individual market uh, so that those who are go out and buy individual coverage have some greater sense of assurance that the coverage will not be rescinded at an inopportune time. Um, on the policy front, the uh, governor has signed legislation that prohibits uh, insurance companies from trying to recoup payments from providers after they have already uh, approved or authorized a course of treatment and then subsequently rescinded care. He also wants to uh, outlaw the practice of offering bonuses or financial incentives to um, claims adjusters and others to incentivize uh, rescinding coverage. And ultimately, the governor wants to see um, a guaranteed uh, issue in California coupled with an individual mandate because we feel very strongly that that would eliminate the need for medical underwriting altogether. Uh, in the individual market. In the meantime, we're going to continue to vigorously enforce the uh, existing law. 
and we're going to continue to look out for the interest of consumers so that we can not only bring light to this issue, but more importantly, bring an end to this very troubling practice. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Ms. Dobertin, are you here for questions, or did you have I'm any? I'm here for questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lembo? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Kevin Limbaugh. I'm the state health care advocate in Connecticut. Uh, Connecticut has a unique setup in that we have an insurance regulator in our insurance department, and I am the full-time advocate for those consumers. On behalf of the growing number of Americans who find themselves trying to get and keep coverage in the individual health insurance market, thank you for your willingness to shed light on this very important issue. The problem of post-claims underwriting abuse and policy rescissions appears to be growing. Mr. Chairman, we have the witness uh, speak into the microphone. I, I cannot hear. I'm sorry. <coughs> The result of this process and the particularly egregious result is the unjust rescission, cancellation or limitation of health insurance contracts after someone is diagnosed with an illness and faced with expensive medical care. In Connecticut, we were fortunate and identified this problem in our market beginning in 2003. My office, the office of our Attorney General Richard Blumenthal and our state insurance department saw a jump in complaints from consumers whose policies were rescinded or limited in some other way. They were sick and didn't understand why their coverage was taken away or limited. Ultimately, a coordinated and successful effort by our offices was undertaken to fix the problem through legislation. Connecticut's law and act concerning post-claims underwriting is the product of three years of work at the legislature to protect consumers from unfair health insurance rescissions, cancellations, or limitations. Under the Connecticut statute, insurers now need to seek the approval of the Connecticut Insurance Department before they can rescind, limit, or cancel a policy. I want to be clear at the outset that this public policy debate is not about consumers who intentionally misrepresent their health status. That's a red herring that is used, utilized as a distraction by those who would rather not have this conversation. Further, we could spend a day arguing about what motivates the desperate, albeit infrequent, action to lie on an application. Instead, I'm focusing on those whose policies were unjustifiably rescinded, canceled, or limited by a carrier to avoid paying claims. In Connecticut, a company denied claims for a resident named Maria, who was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in 2005. The insurer said Maria should have sought treatment and found out the diagnosis sooner, in other words, before seeking a policy. Once the company started receiving her medical claims, it found out she had gone to the doctor for what she thought was a pinched nerve. Uh, she also told the doctor she'd been feeling a little tired. Maria said she wasn't concerned about the way she was feeling because she had been working particularly hard. Tests were done at that time to determine whether there were other issues. These tests did not yield significant results and they were not tests for cancer. The company denied payment for subsequent cancer-related bills, saying that Maria had this condition before she bought the policy and should have sought treatment. Maria ultimately died from her illness. A young man named Frank was taken by surprise when his insurance was rescinded because his insurer alleged that he omitted material information from his insurance application. When Frank applied for coverage, he disclosed that he had occasional headaches. After he applied, the carrier obtained all of Frank's medical records, theoretically for medical underwriting, and then wrote him a policy. Several months after getting the policy, Frank went for a routine eye exam and was referred to a neurologist by that eye doctor. The neurologist diagnosed Frank with multiple sclerosis. Immediately following that diagnosis, the carrier rescinded the policy, stating in effect that he should have known his hit headaches would have led to a diagnosis of MS. The carrier stuck to its position even after receiving a letter from Frank's doctor saying that there would have been no reason at all to suspe suspect MS since Frank was an otherwise healthy young man with a normal exam. Frank was now responsible for more than $30,000 in care that he could not afford. His condition rapidly deteriorated, forcing him to end his employment and seek public insurance and assistance. These are the kinds of people who are impacted by post-claims underwriting abuses, and that impact is medically and financially devastating. Unfortunately, while state insurance departments can often intercede in these cases through market conduct examinations under their existing laws against unfair insurance practices, there is little that can be done as regulators to make it right for these consumers, at least completely. As state regulator, regulatory agencies, they can fix problems going forward making it safe for future consumers, but are limited in what they can do now relative for these relatively uninsurable consumers who are back in the marketplace. States need to stop this problem on the front end with good, clear law that prohibits these abuses and forces companies to seek permission before rescinding a policy. The practice must be stopped on the front end because the cleanup is almost impossible. 
In Connecticut, the insurance department recently concluded a very long and deep investigation of assurance companies, in particular Time Insurance, formerly Fortis, and John Alden. That resulted in a record fine for Connecticut of $2.1 million in fine and more than $900,000 in restitution to consumers. The department did all they could, but the damage to the individuals, in fact, was done. Although the company admitted no wrongdoing, they agreed to pay the fine and restitution. Mr. Chairman, it's my opinion and that of many of my colleagues that our states need to move rapidly to address the issue of post-claims underwriting. It's my hope that legislatures across the country, with your encouragement, will take the following steps to protect consumers and ensure a level playing field in the individual market. We need to create and adopt a state or national uniform application for individual insurance that's clear, easy for consumers to understand, and takes out some of those trip-ups trip that do occur in the application. States must define medical underwriting and be clear that the review of the application alone is not sufficient. Further, states must require that underwriting be complete and all outstanding questions be asked and answered to satisfaction before the policy is written. And finally, there should be creation and adoption of laws to stop post-claims post underwriting abuses and provide greater limitations on a company's ability to rescind or limit a policy without a finding of fact and approval of the state regulator. Since passage of our Connecticut post-claims underwriting law, complaints from consumers have dropped to a handful and the insurance department has received no requests to modify or rescind a policy. I think this speaks to the effect of a good law yet to be tested, but I would encourage my colleagues in other states to join us in ending the practice. Thank you. I want to thank all of you in this panel, and I think it's a panel that made a lot of sense because you're all explaining the problem to us and you're all advocates, if uh, not victims, of trying to do something about the insurance company uh, practices uh, to take away insurance when people need it the most. It really is astounding. And what you've described, Mr. and Mrs. Blazard, is horrible. You, when you're sick, that's when you want that insurance coverage to be there, not to have to have insurance companies come in and, and take it away from you and then say you're stuck with the bill, which I think in your case was $100,000. Is that, isn't that right? Well, um, people think they get insurance coverage and insurance is insurance. But the reality is that most people have group insurance and group insurance spreads the risk. The, the private insurance policies try to avoid the risk. They try to avoid the risk by not insuring people who have been sick if, if they in fact have been sick or saying that if they've had an illness they won't cover any treatment for that illness. If someone's had cancer and they apply for a, a private insurance policy and, of course, they say they have cancer because that's part of the questions that, that are asked. They may be told, well, we'll insure you for everything but cancer. Well, that's, that's, the, that's the business arrangement that can be uh, agreed to. There's no uh, government requirement to do otherwise if it's a private insurance policy. But uh, if once they've asked those questions and uh, all the information has been furnished, they, the insurance company can deny coverage of an individual, but if they agree to cover the individual, they shouldn't be, um, they shouldn't be coming back afterwards when they get the bills for medical care and saying, oh, we're, we're rescinding the policy. And it sounds to me like, in many cases, it's a trumped up argument. Is that, is that your experience? You, Mr. Lembo, you just went through a lot of horrible examples of people who have been denied coverage after they already had the policy and been paying for it on trumped up charges. Is that fair to say? Mr. Chairman, I think in some cases it is fair to say. I think in the case of the Blizzards, that certainly sounds like what happened. Uh, we're looking at a case now that's under investigation where a person's policy was rescinded as she was in a hospital bed being treated for cancer, but the rescission was based on information that was not disclosed around hypertension. Under normal circumstances and without that specter of a large claim coming in, they might have simply limited the coverage to exclude anything related to that hypertension rather yeah. than rescind the whole policy. And tell me again that there's, if somebody was denied health care coverage and had their policy rescinded because when they put on their application they had occasional headaches, that that person was supposed to have known that later he would be or she would be diagnosed with MS? Is that accurate? should have known that it was a large enough problem that she should have sought additional medical attention. Uh, as I stated, she, she didn't think it was that big of a problem. That's really astounding to me. And there are members of Congress who are not aware 
of the fact that individual health care policies, health insurance policies, are different from the group policies. Um, now, let me just say this to you and, and, and to anybody watching this hearing. Uh, if it weren't for a free press, the LA Times particularly, doing a series of articles about this issue, I don't know that uh, the state of California officials and others would have realized what a problem it was. But when the regulators in California and in Connecticut and Utah saw what kind of problem it was, the, these regulators came in and tried to do something to protect people. Uh, we're trying to do the same thing here with this hearing because there is a federal law called HIPAA that's supposed to stop insurance companies from carrying on these practices. And we're going to hear in the second panel from the Center for for Medicare and Medicaid services. They didn't want to be on with anybody else. They represent the uh, Bush administration. They didn't want to be on a panel with anybody else. We could have had them on with the regulators, but they didn't want that. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Blazard, I, I, I just can't tell you how uh, pleased I am you would be willing to come and talk about this. This is not a happy situation in your lives uh, to have your insurance coverage canceled on you. You certainly believe you were not treated fairly. Is, isn't that the case? No, certainly not. Uh, you know, we were as honest as we could be. Uh, we certainly weren't trying to mislead anybody. Uh, you know, I just, we felt all alone. You know, it's, you know, I, I'm surprised that there are other you know, people that are experiencing the same thing. Well, it's clear that your situation was not an isolated incident. Because you're hearing time, it from others as well. At the time, you feel like you're all alone. Yes. It's you against the world. Yeah. Well, I, I, this committee is going to open uh, an investigation into the practices of the private health insurance uh, market. We're going to be sending questionnaires and documents, requests to the major health insurers to get answers to these questions. And I'm pleased that all of you are here to give us uh, your perspective. Uh, Mr. Davis. Mr. Chairman, uh, I wasn't here earlier. Maybe we can combine the second and third panels. That would certainly be okay with us, uh, just uh, so we could uh, expedite and get the appropriate questions. Uh, I would ask unanimous consent that my opening statement go into the record, so I won't have to uh, Without objection, all opening statements by members will be put into the record. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mrs. Blazer, let me ask you, um, uh, obviously, the, your, the rescission issue in your case is, uh, I think, very disturbing uh, to all of us. On a later panel, the committee is going to hear about a proposal to give individuals in situations like yours an opportunity to appeal a rescission to an objective panel that includes a doctor and a lawyer, which would have the power to reinstate the policy immediately. So you get an instant appeal to an independent group, including a doctor and a lawyer. And um, even if you lose that, you can still sue. So it wouldn't take away your right to sue if you were to lose that panel. But what it would allow is it would give you a, uh, uh, an independent group to take a look at something like this very, very quickly. Because having to go to court is a long, you know, even if you win, you lose. Because you've got carrying costs and, and you're not sometimes getting the care you need in the meantime. Had that kind of option been available to you uh, and your husband, would you have pursued that understanding that if the panel did rule against you, you could still sue? Would that be something that could be of interest to you? As I understand it, yes. Okay. I mean, it's obviously the devil's in the details. I'm just talking about, I'm not trying to trap you. I mean, conceptually, uh, but later panel, I think you, you need an instant right of appeal to some independent group in a case like this that can call balls and strikes right off and sometimes uh, uh, mitigate or solve this earlier on so you don't have to go to court. If you lose and you, and you think you got a raw deal, you'd still have the right to go to court. That's, that's, the, that's uh, one of the concepts. Um, and it would allow you to get re in, uh, uh, possibly uh, the opportunity to get your insurance uh, reinstated on an expedited basis. Now, I just wanted to get your feel. I think it seems to me that's a reasonable uh, route to go, but we'll talk about that a little more. I just wanted to get your uh, reaction to it. Secretary Bonner, given California's well-publicized problems with rescissions, do you think that the federal government should take over enforcement of HIPAA protections? Well, HIPAA being a federal law, I think it would be inappropriate 
uh, thing for the federal government to be taking a hard look at, yes. Okay. From the state regulatory perspective, under what circumstances should the federal government take over state regulation in the individual insurance market for failure to substantially enforce HIPAA? Boy, that's, a, I think, a very difficult uh, question because uh, I don't think that it's, it's in our interest to uh, have too many um, carve-outs of our state regulatory jurisdiction. As I say, HIPAA being a, a federal law, I think it's a very appropriate thing to be looking at. Uh, beyond that, I'm not sure if you're suggesting um, the state taking over certain aspects of our Knox Keene or other uh, insurance regulation. Well, the, the problem always is if the federal government isn't doing its job, sometimes the state's better off in a state like California. Sometimes states don't do the job. I mean, that's always the dilemma in terms of do you federalize something like that or give it back to the uh, uh, states. Um, Mr. Limbo, let me ask you, from a state perspective, under what circumstances do you think the federal government should step in and take over state enforcement of uh, HIPAA protections? Uh, like Mr. Bonner and Mr. Davis, I would have to say I, I, I'm not sure on its face what those circumstances would be. Um, we would want to preserve the right of states to regulate insurance as they're doing now. I think uh, the federal government has a role in encouraging uh, better and stepped up well, enhancement. Let, let me, here, here's my understanding. The yes. individual health um, insurance market is regulated almost exclusively by states. Uh, CMS is responsible for making sure that states enforce protections that are contained in HIPAA. That's the current law. Only if the states fail to enforce HIPAA can the federal government take over enforcement, and that has not happened. So I'm guess, guessing you know, with that perspective, from a state perspective, you, when, when do you think the federal government should step in and take over state enforcement of HIPAA protections? And secondly, do you think that uh, prior to the recent enactment of state legal reforms in, in uh, Connecticut was, prior to those um, reforms, was Connecticut failing to substantially enforce HIPAA protections? Um, I'll take the second piece first, if you don't mind. And yeah, that you're is, probably uh, more familiar with that. <laughs> uh, the, uh, there was enforcement activity around Connecticut's existing unfair insurance practices law. Those laws exist in most states because they are based on an NAIC model that's been adopted by both states and give the states lots of opportunity to regulate around this issue without naming it specifically. Um, I think at this point, um, the uh, conversation that happens on an ongoing basis between CMS and the NAIC around ways for those two groups to work together to make sure that there is, in fact, even uh, enforcement um, seems to be working um, but could be encouraged. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. and Mrs. Blazard, I, 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 too, thank you all for being here today and um, was sorry that you are continuing to experience this nightmare. Mr. Blazard, you and your, your wife had recently married, is that right? And then you decided that you needed to get both health and life insurance, is that right? Yes. And you met with an insurance agent who was fully informed about your health, including your back, is that right? Yes, they were friends of mine. Uh -huh. And in March 2005, Regents Blue Cross and Blue Shield issued you an insurance policy do you remember how much you were paying in premiums? I think it was in the $300 range. But you paid them? Oh, yeah. And Mrs. Blazard, in October, you had a serious accident. And uh, just hearing your testimony, and I so, so we reiterated, you said, my physician told me that the fracture is so severe, many individuals die as a result of, the fra of, of it. The fractures in my back were impact fractures which shatter the bone at the point of greatest impact. I also had a pulmonary contusion, three broken ribs, and a brain injury. Several hours of neurosurgery were performed to save my spine. I spent three weeks in the hospital in a physical and in physical rehabilitation unit, and I'm continuing to do physical therapy. My medical bills are over $100,000. Is that right? Yes. And has the and and it's your testimony that the insurance company hadn't paid a dime is that right well at first they paid and once the bills started mounting they said that they were going to look into it and then they took all the money back and we were left responsible for all of it now do you have health insurance now no are you concerned that uh, you can or won't be able to get it that's correct 
And what impact has this incident had on you, on your family? Indescribable stress. And can you tell us a little bit about it? You know, what happens so often, I mean, we, and I, I was very glad to hear Mr. Bonner's testimony and Mr. Lim, Limbo. But what happens too often is that the insurance companies collect. And then when it comes time, when somebody is going through a nightmare, the very thing that they paid insurance for, they then suddenly go AWOL. And individuals like you are left in pain and suffering. And as I listen to Mr. Limbo's uh, testimony, one of the things that I like about the Connecticut system is that they have to have basically pre-approval before doing the rescinding. Is that right, Mr. Limbo? Yes, Mr. Cummings. And it seems like that system, and then I also am interested to see that in your testimony, Mr. Limbo, you talk about how since the passage of, of, of your system, uh, you've had very few complaints from consumers. Is that right? That's correct. And why do you think that is? I think sometimes the best law never has to be enforced. What do you mean by that? Having good law on the books will often put an end to certain behaviors that are questionable and it never gets to the point where it has to be an, an enforced law. And the, fact the law is there. and the fact is, is that, you know, when you think about a person going through the trauma of the blazards or somebody who walks into a doctor's office and I've often said that we are all one diagnosis from disaster. But they walk into a, a, a doctor's office and the doctor, you say God forbid, gives them a, a diagnosis of cancer. They've got to have surgery, radiation, chemotherapy. And, but at the same time, they've got to tackle a question of an insurance, whether the insurance company is going to pay. That's a major problem, isn't it? It is. Do you see those kinds of situations, uh, Mr. Mr. Bonner, in your experience? Situations where the insurance company just refuses to pay yes. all of the previously incurred medical bills? That is correct. Yes. I mean, you see that that's often the case is uh, that sometimes what prompts the review in the first instance is the utilization of services. So it's the, the big ticket medical bills that sometimes prompts the insurance company to go back and take a look at the application and that then re sometimes results in the decision to rescind. Now going back to the Connecticut system, do you, what is your opinion of that system, uh, Mr. Mr. Bonner? Well, we are uh, taking a look at many of the same uh, types of things. We have uh, already developed a model application that uh, is available uh, through the regulatory, um, uh, for, through the Department of Managed Health Care. Uh, but we're also looking at legislation that, um, that might uh, lay out an independent review process, uh, instant appeal, some of the other uh, pre-approval, some of the other things that were referenced in Connecticut. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. Mr. Eisen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Bonner, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a fellow Californian. I, I appreciate the good work that you and the Governor are trying to do. Uh, as you heard earlier, uh, because we're not able to sort of get our questions a bead between yourself, the others, and the representative from, if you will, the healthcare industry. Uh, I'm going to ask you a series of questions. In some cases, they may be obvious, but remember, I'm going to be later asking the healthcare industry uh, to to uh, to comment on some of these same things. Uh, for now, I'll I'll look at it as a California issue, only because as a Californian, I'm a little more familiar. First of all, my understanding is in California, the insurance commissioner has authority over all insurance except health care. Is that roughly correct, that uh, commissioner, uh, insurance commissioner Poisoner has limited jurisdiction in this area? Well, it's, it's, it's not entirely accurate that he, he has jurisdiction over health insurance. It's the distinction between insur uh, regulating in the insurance product, which is uh, basically uh, indemnity insurance versus managed care, you know, uh, HMO insurance, which is what uh, the Department of Managed Health Care regulates. Okay, so my question would be, do you believe that even if it's joint, that, uh, that greater jurisdiction to the elected insurance commissioner might be helpful in bringing uh, pressure to bear to ensure that these kinds of uh, selective abuses don't happen? 
Um, you know, I don't see the, the structure of the regulator itself as being uh, key to the solution here. I think uh, aggressive enforcement and uh, clear rules and, and aggressive enforcement of those rules are really the key. Okay. Well, uh, if I can get to a couple of those potential rules. If, in fact, transferability was an absolute right, meaning that no pre-existing conditions in California could be looked at under any circumstances as long as you were continuously insured, would an absolute statement of that in all 50 states be helpful uh, to you're saying prevent essentially people having to, if they're continuously insured, having to uh, find themselves, uh, you know, going through this process of looking in the rearview mirror and uh, as a series of questions here. Uh, to make sure I understand, you're asking if we just prohibited the the practice of rescission or, or no, required you, guaranteed issue? No, that or? As, long as, as long as someone didn't have a break in insurance, when they went from a group insurance to an individual assurance, their background would be prohibited. In other words, if you will, an assigned selection that, that if you want to do business in California, you have to uh, accept anyone who's going, let's say, from a COBRA coverage, uh, having left an employer that did have care, to an individual. We'd have that right as a condition in California. Would that would that, in fact, distribute the risk in a way that would be fair, but at the same time prevent a huge amount of people having to deal with their, in some cases, pre-existing conditions? Um, I think, as I understand the, the, the question, one of the things that, that you would be concerned about when you refer to distributing the risk is um, the, the scenario where there are substantial numbers of people who, in the individual market in particular, who, who simply are not in the system. And so uh, what you you know, when you, you don't have that same opportunity right. to, to right. share risk or distribute as right. you would in a group, group right. environment. Right, and I, I want to I get to that, but, you know, this is assuming people coming out of a distributed risk. Secondly, uh, uh, limiting pre-existing conditions uh, to, uh, to ones which are chronic and life-threatening. In other words, the state could, could eliminate conditions that are, that are unrelated to the claim from being allowed to cause cancellation of the claim. State could do that, just yes or no. It's certainly within the power of the state. State could do that. Yes or no, if you don't mind. Oh, is yes. Is it a good idea? Is it a good idea? You know, there have been uh, specific conditions, and Amy may speak to this um, right. better, but there are specific conditions where the legislature has made a determination uh, that uh, they should, are not okay. grounds for cancellation or well, rescission. And in this case, an accident, in other words, an event which is traumatic in its nature, uh, would that be probably first and foremost among them that, that even if you knew you had cancer and didn't say so, but you were in a car accident, uninsured for some, you know, whether you were just a rider in the car and you became seriously injured, cancellation, even though you didn't say you had cancer, the injuries are, un, un, you know, unrelated. By definition, wouldn't, it, wouldn't that be one of the first ones that California should insure would not allow this retroactive cancellation. I agree with you that an accident should not be grounds for cancellation or, or rescission, yes. Okay. Uh, once again, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Blazard, you have our deepest, uh, uh, not just sympathy, but recognition that you shouldn't have to be here today. This shouldn't have happened. And uh, I appreciate the Chairman's willingness to uh, try to bring focus for change. And uh, I yield back and thank the Chairman and thank you for being here. Gentlemen's time has expired. Before I recognize the next member, uh, members have a lot of conflicts in their schedule, and um, that just is the way this place operates. Uh, and I'm going to have to go to a conference committee that I pleaded with the Senate not to call at the same time, but they uh, didn't pay attention to that. So uh, that's just uh, uh, so that's why I wanted to speak out of order. Uh, there's been another request of changing the panels. And um, Mr. Davis said perhaps we could put the insurance companies with CMS. Now, I suppose we could have put everybody on one panel and we could have moved this hearing faster. But I really don't think that uh, makes sense because CMS uh, is the regulator. And as the regulator for the federal government, they didn't even want to be on a panel with the regulators from the state government, because that would have made some sense. But to put the insurance companies with CMS doesn't make sense, so, and you can't have everybody talk all at once. So we have to have witnesses get a chance to speak and ask questions. 
so we've had this panel, which we thought made sense to put you all together. We have CMS next, and then we have the insurance companies. Now, there's a concern on the Republican side of the aisle that people won't be back for the insurance companies. They won't be here for the insurance companies. Well, we only have two Republicans here now, and I hope they'll be here, but I don't see Republicans rushing in to, to be here at all at the moment, but they do have conflicts in their schedule. We have some Democrats, but we have all of our Democrats. So the chair's prerogative is to set the agenda, to call the hearings and to set the agenda and to, and to in consultation with the Republicans, establish the order for uh, the witnesses. And I, I, I'm, I'm going to um, uh, stick with what we have even though this request has been made, because I think what we have makes sense. I will certainly try to be back here for the insurance companies, because I particularly want to hear from them and ask them questions. So, uh, Mr. Davis, um, yeah, I know you've made that request, and I hope you will acquiesce. And well, you're, you're the chairman. Uh, we just move ahead. Let's get going. Okay, so thank you. Uh, Mr. Lynch. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And right on point, I'm actually... Uh, uh, in two hearings simultaneously, one down the hall. So I'm going to have to leap out and go over to that hearing uh, and, and hope to come back in time for the insurance uh, company testimony. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for your uh, willingness to uh, uh, work with, with the uh, minority as well. I want to thank the panel uh, for coming forward with their testimony, helping the committee with its work. Uh, following the chairman's initial remarks, uh, the, the essence of our insurance system is really to, to spread risk, to distribute risk across a, a wider, healthier, uh, less accident-prone population. And uh, what, what has been described here, uh, this practice of post-claims underwriting, basically turns the whole theory of insurance on its head. Uh, in other words, uh, the, the end result here, uh, the, at least the cases that have been described here, uh, demonstrate a, a pattern of conduct, and, and I'd say thousands of cases recommend, uh, demonstrate a pattern of conduct uh, by some insurance companies in some states uh, in which the insurer actually accepts an application for insurance and accepts payment of premiums from the consumer until the point at which a claim is filed. Uh, then it appears, at least from the cases we've seen here today, the insurance company rescinds the insurance agreement, uh, in many cases based on uh, specious uh, reasoning. The end result is that the consumer is led to rely to his or her detriment on the uh, inducement by the uh, insurance company uh, to rely uh, up to the point that the harm or the illness is, is actually irreparable. Uh, because but for the insurer's inducement, uh, the consumer could have kept on looking for insurance elsewhere, but it, it was sort of trapped by the, the, the insurer's conduct. Uh, and again, the number of cases that have, have been cited here uh, in California, Connecticut, and elsewhere indicates that there really is a, a national uh, pattern of conduct here that, that is indeed troubling. Uh, Mr. Lembo, uh, you, you provided a lot of testimony here today uh, and I want to ask you about a couple of cases that you've, you've described. You describe a case of a woman who purchased health insurance and then was later diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma, a cancer that attacks the lymph nodes. Uh, after she received her diagnosis, her, her insurer terminated her coverage. Uh, can you tell me why the insurer terminated uh, the coverage in that case? Yes, sir, I just have to uh, flip to that one. I'm sorry. In the case of the woman with Hodgkin's lymphoma, a 34-year-old woman, um, it, was, it was a straight pre-existing condition charge on the part of the insurance companies. Uh, they said that uh, she should have sought treatment uh, because she had experienced minor shortness of breath while exercising. Shortness of breath while exercising. That's correct. You're serious? Okay. Was there any connection between her shortness of breath while exercising and, and the lymphoma, in, in your opinion? Uh, not being a doctor, um, I, All right. I'll, I would I'll say no. Go on that one. <laughs> I, I want to ask you about another example. Some of these are, are really outrageous. 
according to your statement, you had a, a young man in good health, like you named him Frank. Uh, he disclosed to the insurer that he had occasional headaches, that the insurer agreed to issue a policy nevertheless, and, and then several months later, Frank was diagnosed with multiple cirrhosis. Uh, after learning of that diagnosis, the insurer rescinded Frank's policy. Uh, you, you, you are more familiar with the detail of this case. What, was the d rescission in this case uh, justified, in your opinion? No, it was not. Okay. I know that uh, uh, that uh, there are tens of thousands of cases cited in, in California and, and Connecticut and elsewhere. Uh, is it your opinion that this is an isolated uh, practice, or these are, these are outliers, or does this, as I suspect, uh, represent more of a pattern of conduct by by perhaps a narrow group of insurers. I think that is probably the case, uh, Mr. Lynch, that it is um, not a common practice, at least not in Connecticut, uh, but the, uh, the outcome um, of that process is pretty awful uh, for consumers. So in a state of 3.4 million, when you get a couple hundred cases of rescission, uh, that, that's a trend and a spike. Okay. Mr. Bonner, just the same question on uh, the scope of this. Chairman's time is up. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think that it's um, the, the number of cases we've seen, almost 5,000, about roughly 4,800 um, in the last few years, uh, suggests that, it, that it's a common practice. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Bill Bray. Mr. Bonner, uh, we've heard a lot about uh, uh, this problem in California, and um, I guess there's no uniform. Uh, national policy on reporting recessions or whatever is. Uh, do you think California is unique in any way, and uh, uh, and that is why it seems to be focused more in California, or why is California such a hotbed? Yeah, um, the answer your, uh, your the short answer to your question is I, I don't think there's anything structurally unique about uh, California, particularly since we're talking about the individual uh, market. And I think um, part of it, obviously, is the numbers. You know, it's a large state. I mean, we have almost 3 million, uh, I think, roughly 3 million in the individual market. So just the, the scale of, uh, and the numbers, is, I think, is significant. Um, but I would uh, venture to guess that, that, um, that if you just adjust for population and so on, that you'd find that it's probably a, a routine. Many of the, the same carriers in California are national companies, you know, so the, those that we mentioned, the Kaisers, Health, HealthNet, Civic Care. Um, are national companies, and so uh, some of these practices are, are uh, the function of national uh, corporate practice and policy. So I don't know that there's anything unique to California that would suggest the problem is greater there than, uh, than other states. Well, if the problem isn't greater there, the problem itself, <clears throat> the, uh, if uh, you were judging by the complaints themselves or the highlights of the, of the problem, it goes far beyond our proportionality in population. Um, is there, you know, is it a heightened sensitivity? Is it the fact that the, the reporting or the sensitivity or the, the concerns about that is a little more heightened in California than it may be in the general population of the United States? Because it seems like proportionality in population, even though we are the big guy, um, we still seem to have more press, more media, more um, reporting coming out of California um, than even the numbers would justify. Do you think they're just? Uh, you say you don't think the problem's any worse than anywhere else in the country. Do you think the sensitivity to the issue may be what is driving the 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 appearance, at least, of a um, more activity in uh, in um, or more concern in California based on what we've seen? I think that um, uh, maybe a variation on that theme, I would say, uh, rather than sensitivity, I say awareness, meaning that um, we have a, have done a lot of work over the last several years to increase uh, consumer awareness of what their rights are and made it easier for consumers to uh, make bring complaints, uh, not necessarily legal complaints, but uh, just complaints with the regulator and through their, their health plans. 
So I think all of those things, and, and uh, in addition to uh, the private litigation that we've seen, the more that you do to uh, shed light on the issue and, and uh, let people know that, that they have uh, some form of redress, uh, the more people you're going to have uh, raising the issue, and, and hence it, it's uh, much more transparent on the regulatory radar as well. Well, I think the, you know, the, the sensitivity to consumer protection in California has been something that you know the whole world's talked about before. And as somebody who's come from a family of lawyers, it also happens to be that California, proportionally per capita, has more lawyers than any other state in the union. So uh, it might raise a little degree there too. But thank you very much. I appreciate it. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Murphy. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I know uh, Chairman Waxman had to go to a conference committee, but I'd just like to thank him for uh, keeping the order of panels that we have here today. Uh, I'm going to go out on a limb and take a guess that the uh, Blazards uh, don't have a lobbyist or a representative uh, here in Washington. I'm pretty certain that the families and the individuals that Mr. Lembo talked about don't have lobbyists or representatives here in Washington. Uh, and, and I, for one, have absolutely no problem with individual citizens coming to Washington, the stories of individual citizens being told here, uh, being given preference. Uh, to associations and corporations who will have every opportunity after this panel is done to reach out to the members that didn't get to make it to this uh, hearing and make their case. Uh, I, I think that is how hearings should be run. Um, I think we should hear all the evidence, but I have absolutely no problem with regular, average, everyday people getting a little bit of preferential treatment in terms of how the stories are being told here, given that they don't have the type of representation that others do. Uh, Mr. Lembo, uh, uh, first of all, I want to thank you for coming. Um, I was in the state legislature for um, a number of years when the office was created um, and have watched it grow and have watched it become an asset uh, for um, consumers in Connecticut. Um, and I guess my question is this, for all the states out there that don't have the new uh, statutory structure that we've put in place in Connecticut, um, what were the tools available to you before this law passed or to the insurance commissioner when you were receiving these uh, hundreds of phone calls? What was the recourse that you had or what was the recourse that those individuals uh, had um, when they were seeing these rescissions? Thank you, Mr. Murphy. Uh, first of all, I, I always believe that for every call we get, there are probably 10 that we don't. Um, and I think that's mostly because uh, People, A, don't feel empowered to fight that big fight um, and also um, maybe second-guess themselves. Did I complete the application appropriately? Is the company right? That said, um, as I mentioned earlier, th there are model laws on unfair insurance practices in most states in the country. They are very useful. Um, some of our cases, we were able to utilize the pieces of that law um, to, to get an appropriate outcome for consumers, but in others, we were not. It wasn't until we had very specific language, language that we were able to, to get relief and, and I hope stop the practice. And in many of the cases that you were describing, um, you were really talking about the insurance companies asking these patients and these consumers to be doctors themselves, that they should have known that something was wrong uh, and should have sought uh, treatment and help before they um, submitted an application. It's bad enough that we now have insurance companies acting as doctors and now we're asking the consumers and the clients to be doctors as well. And I guess the question is this, what kind of normal medical underwriting would we expect um, and this is a question potentially for Mr. Bonner and Ms. Dobertine as well. Would we expect of an insurance company up front when they see an application with uh, a notice of shortness of breath or back pain or, um, you know, other specific problems, what's, what's the normal obligation on behalf of that insurance company to go out and do due do diligence? There is certainly a growing body of agreement around what real medical underwriting is. Uh, I think it's fair um, for a company that is faced with an application that has no flags in it, there are no yeses to any of the medical condition uh, questions, uh, to go forward with that application under certain circumstances. Um, but any, as you mentioned, any of the things that you mentioned should cause the company to then seek the medical record and investigate further. And once they complete medical underwriting, in the academic sense, medical underwriting, not a shorthand medical underwriting that is just a review of a screening tool, which is what the application is, in a rush to sort of own on a market in a particular state, because it's a lucrative market. Um, if we get there, I think we will see a lessening uh, of this issue. And frankly, the uh, companies will be given uh, an opportunity 
um, to fulfill their obligation to their corporate entity and to, to their, their stockholders in some case to make sure that they are, are doing their job as well. Mr. Bonner, any comments on the, on the, the, the scope of uh, upfront medical underwriting that we really want to be re requiring if we were to proffer a uniform law or encourage states to adopt such laws? Uh, well, short of a, of a uniform law or um, much more detail in what the regulatory requirement is, I think you definitely want to see reasonable inquiry into uh, those issues that uh, may be um, uh, suggested on the application itself. I think the other thing that um, is very important is to look at the uh, qualifications of the, those who are actually doing the review as well, because one of the issues that we have uh, found is that in many cases the person reviewing the application uh, and the information may not have the necessary qualifications to, to determine whether they should be making further inquiry to, uh, uh, to discover a problem. So we think that um, there needs to be some uh, very clear rules on, on what's asked on the application and very qualified um, reviewers as well. Anything you would add, add to that? Just the new case law in California uh, did add that insurers would be obligated to verify the not only the accuracy but the veracity of the answers on the application so that uh, there should be more than just reviewing an application and stamping it okay, that they actually do have the duty of the investigation uh, prior to issuing the policy rather than post claims. Thank, thank you very much, Ms. Spear. And, and thank you to the panelists for being here. I apologize for coming in and going out and coming in, but again, a number of hearings are taking place. I want to welcome the regulators from California here. Um, it's great to see you again. Uh, Congressman Bilbrey asked a question that I think needs to be explored a, bit, a little bit um, more. The question was, you know, is this kind of something more attributed to California than anywhere else where there are more cases? My understanding is that California is unique in the country in that so many Californians are in managed care. The vast majority of Californians, in fact, are in managed care. So they're in group health insurance settings where this would not be an issue. And I would offer that as a question to either of you to, to answer. Uh, well, that, that is certainly true that we have uh, a much uh, greater saturation of managed care in California than you see in other uh, parts of the country. So. It would suggest that in areas where there are a larger penetration of individual um, health insurance, that this is going to be a problem. Obviously, it's a problem in the individual market, not in the group market. So in states across this country where individual health plans have a greater penetration, this is conceivably more likely to be a problem. I think that's a logical uh, assumption uh, to make uh, in the absence of, uh, of information to the contrary. And in your um, assessment in California, uh, you have identified a number of insurers who have engaged in this practice. Um, do you have any reason to doubt that it is a practice that is embraced by most insurers, not just in California but across the country? Uh, no, you know, my, my um, assumption or, or I, let me back up and say that first, you know, the insurance industry is a very risk averse uh, industry and very competitive uh, as well. And what they uh, seek is uh, clear rules and consistent application. And what you see oftentimes or what I've seen over the years is both the regulator and now having uh, oversight of the regulator is that, uh, that the competition in the industry is such that uh, when you have one company that t has one approach or practice. Um, you often see some consistency in that approach and practice uh, uh, among their competitors. And so uh, I think if at least that's what's Im implicit in your question is uh, do, would we uh, tend to believe that the practice is, is common amongst uh, insurance companies in general and I'd say um, uh, it's likely. I, I, this is a, a hypothetical of course. but. We are excluding fraud. So anyone who fills out an application and fraudulently fills out an application says uh, they, have, they don't have any pre-existing conditions when in fact they did have pre-existing conditions is not someone we're talking about. We're talking about rescission where it is done unrelated to fraud. Shouldn't we just create a burden on the insurer to establish that in fact it is fraud before rescission can take place? 
Well, you may uh, speak that some of the recent case law in California has moved closer to uh, that result, but you may want to speak to that a little more directly, Amy. In fact, California law requires a showing of willful misrepresentation before they can rescind if they have completed medical underwriting. The new case law did uh, delineate that they have to either absolutely complete medical underwriting in order to rescind or make a showing of willful misrepresentation. It does require documentation. It does require looking into rather than just making that assumption. So that is case law but not statutory law? It's, no, this, it's, it's based on the statute uh, in California. All right. So it's then just an issue of enforcement. If you don't hear about it, you can't enforce it? We have uh, investigated in depth, not just waiting for complaints, but we have investigated all five major health plans who have uh, any products in the in individual market. All right. Thank, um, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Platts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'll be uh, real brief here. Uh, just uh, Mr. Lembo, uh, apologize with, with coming in late, uh, and I, I don't think I'm being repetitive, but in your testimony, uh, you talked about the issue of uh, intentional misrepresentations as being more of a red herring uh, issue. Uh, can you expound on that? Is that because it's a, a very small percentage, in your opinion, and it's blown out of proportion, or kind of? Uh, give I think us that's right, sir. I think it's a very small percentage of the group of folks who have their policies rescinded. What and uh, what level would you put it at, in your opinion? Uh, you know, not having real data to support that. It's just our experience based on the casework that we do. Um, it is uh, given the work you do and 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 seeing that not as a driving issue here, apparently. Uh, by your testimony, um, is it something that rescissions should not be allowed or there should be a high bar for uh, a rescission uh, being granted? I, th I think the rescission should, uh, before a, can, a policy can be rescinded, there needs to be a, um, a showing that there was a willful, knowing misrepresentation of health status. It, in, in Connecticut, what is the, uh, the standard? Knowing. Knowing. Uh, and and um, th your opinion is just that that should be replicated uh, nationally? I, I we went for intentional but lost that particular battle. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much to our witnesses. We want to thank you very much for your testimony to the Blazards. Um, we thank you. Um, we uh, clearly, I think, that, I think everyone uh, on both sides are very concerned about what happen to you and I don't think we want to see that happen to anybody else and we'll do our very very best I want to thank the other witnesses providing the testimony this is the United States of America we can do better by our citizens and um, again all of your testimony is very helpful and you're now dismissed thank you very much we will now call did you did you have something no, you can call the panel yeah. and I'll make my comments. we will now call Miss Abby Block the director Center for Drug and Health Plan Choice, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services in Washington. Hey, Mr. Chairman, while she's getting here, let me just note the reason I want to combine panels is we allowed Mr. Waxman to move the hearing up to 930 this morning. It was inconvenient to us uh, for, for different reasons. We allowed him to do that. I had a 12 o'clock appointment I couldn't make and I wanted to get our appointment while I was still here. It had nothing to do with bringing lobbyists up front. I want to underscore that. Uh, there is a proposal that they have. It would have been interesting to have people comment on, but this is not an adversarial hearing. And I think I this kind of rhetoric is exactly what's wrong with Congress. Everything's got to get torn up into partisanship. partisanship. We have tried our best to accommodate, uh, you know, the majority with their time. They didn't give appropriate notice for it, but we knew this would be. Uh, uh, we wanted Mr. Waxman to be able to get his hearing in and be here because we knew this uh, um, uh, other committee meeting was called that uh, that he couldn't avoid. Thank you. Mr. Davis, I want to thank you for your, uh, your comments. We, um, but irre irrespective of that, I think we can still try to resolve these, these issues for the people of our great country. Ms. Block, it is uh, the policy of this committee to swear in our, our witnesses. Would you stand and raise your right hand? Do you sw solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Let the record reflect that the witness has answered in the affirmative. We're very, very, first of all, we're very happy to have you with us. You may proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cummings, uh, and uh, our thanks to uh, 
Chairman Waxman for inviting us today and uh, thank you Mr. Davis and distinguished members of the committee for giving us this opportunity to speak. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here to discuss the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services role in the oversight of individual health insurance markets. As you know, the agency's core mission is administering Medicare, Medicaid, and the state children's health insurance program. As director of the Center for Drug and Health Plan Choice within CMS, I oversee day-to-day -day operations and lead new policy development with respect to individual insurance market issues within the agency's jurisdiction, as well as with respect to private plans in Medicare. We share the chairman's concern with recent reports that insurers in the individual market might be using rescission as a means for circumventing the guaranteed renewability requirements established in the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996. HIPAA is very clear that with limited exceptions, an individual insurance policyholder has a right to guaranteed renewability. In other words, an insurer must renew or continue in force an individual's existing coverage unless a specific exception is met. The most relevant exception for purposes of today's discussion is if the policyholder acted fraudulently or made an intentional misrepresentation of a material fact under the terms of the coverage. CMS believes that the states have primary responsibility for enforcement of guaranteed renewability and that CMS can act only if it determines that a state fails to substantially enforce the requirement. Specifically, if a state fails to enact legislation that meets or exceeds uh, federal HIPAA standards or if it otherwise fails to substantially enforce the HIPAA standards, the United States Department of Health and Human Services has authority to investigate and, if necessary, take over direct enforcement of the standards in that state. While there is federal oversight authority, there is no direct federal role in regulating the private individual insurance market. It has been suggested that in certain states, private insurance issuers might be using rescission, a state contract law concept, to circumvent guaranteed renewability. The role of CMS in addressing such situations hinges on the specific facts of the situation, including any actions already taken by the state. If there is any indication that the rescissions may be occurring for reasons that are inconsistent with the HIPAA guaranteed renewability standards, that would be a red flag that the state may be failing to substantially enforce those standards. CMS could then begin a process set forth in our regulations to assess the state's compliance with HIPAA requirements. Depending on the outcome of our investigation, CMS could ultimately take direct control over enforcement of guaranteed renewability in a state. In light of recent scrutiny of the use of rescission in certain states, the National Association of Insurance Commissioners established a work group in May of 2008 to examine and develop recommendations relating to the use of rescission in the individual health insurance market. CMS is actively engaged in this effort and we applaud the NAIC's leadership on this emerging issue, particularly given HIPAA's clear intent that states take the lead in enforcing individual insurance market protections. It's CMS's goal to work collaboratively with states and other stakeholders to enforce policyholder protections established by HIPAA. We'll do whatever is possible within the scope of our jurisdiction to ensure that states are substantially enforcing HIPAA protections. 
thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. I want to uh, thank you very much for your testimony. And let me just ask you, there, there's a federal law, uh, the HIPAA Act of 1996, that sets a clear federal standard that protects policyholders against unfair rescissions. And under that law, your agency is charged with enforcing this minimum standard and ensuring that insurers are not illegally terminating policies. Is that correct? Is that what you're testifying to? Uh, yes, although HIPAA does not specifically mention rescission, it does mention uh, the discontinuance of coverage. All right. And the witnesses on our first panel, were you here to hear them? Yes, I was. Matter of fact, they're sitting right behind you. Uh, describe how insurance companies have engaged in widespread abuses and routinely terminated policies after the policyholder gets a serious illness or injury. The witnesses on the first panel told us that this is very likely a national problem, not one limited to their particular states. And in many states, however, such as Utah, where the Blazards lost their coverage, there has been no state enforcement. Now, tell me, Ms. Block, has CMS taken any enforcement action with regard to improper uh, rescission practices? Any action? CMS has not because, remember, that uh, the only time that CMS has any jurisdiction is if a state, if there is any indication that a state is not substantially enforcing the HIPAA provision. And how would you know? We would have to receive specific complaints to that effect. And in other we words, have not received any such complaints. And so, that, in other words, a, a complaint would likely come from someone who uh, felt that they were a victim, is that correct? Yes, that would be correct. And so you've, you're saying that you have never received any complaints, is that to your knowledge? Not in regard to rescission. Uh, over the last five years, uh, we received a total of five complaints about HIPAA compliance, uh, particularly in the state of Missouri. But in, uh, in regard to rescission? Those, none of those were in regard to rescission. I see. Now, one of the reasons your agency, now you hasn't uh, taken any action to protect policyholders, is that you have devoted almost no resources to this important responsibility. HIPAA is a big law with numerous enforcement provisions. For example, requirements relating to patient privacy, insurance portability, standards preventing drive-through births, and mental health parity, and all of which need to be enforced. But we were told by the administration that you all only have four people assigned to the task of enforcing all of HIPAA's provisions, and that's throughout the entire United States of America. Is that right? No, I don't believe that's correct, sir. So I have what four people on my staff specifically um, that do enforce, have responsibility and jurisdiction over uh, specific HIPAA provisions. Uh, HIPAA is, a, as you say, a very big statute. The Department of Labor has jurisdiction over some aspects. Uh, the Department of the Treasury has jurisdiction. Well, I'm just talking so about. I don't represent the whole United States. Well, I'm States talking about government. with this, with what you testified to today with regard to rescission. Uh, you all have jurisdiction over that. Is that correct? That's correct. You're, you and, and the four people. Uh, yes, okay. I have four. And they do other things other than staff. and they do other things other than the rescission uh, oversight. Is that correct? They do everything related to the private insurance market. Very well. Four people for the entire United States of America. Today, we heard appalling stories of truly abusive conduct by insurers who unfairly rescind policies, leaving people uninsured and uninsurable in the middle of a medical crisis. Your agency is the ultimate authority of HIPAA's protections, and it's your job under the law to make sure that insurers in all states are complying with HIPAA's important safeguards for individual policyholders. How can you possibly enforce all of that with four people? We believe that the states have primary responsibility and that our jurisdiction is to ensure that states are, in fact, substantially enforcing the HIPAA provisions. If we have any indication that a state is not doing that, we have the ability through our regulations to investigate and take appropriate action. And we, I assure you we will do that. But that has never happened to your knowledge, is that correct? That has not happened. And when you hear stories like the Blazards, uh, does that concern you and does that make you want to go back and do something about it? 
It concerns me very, very much, and I, I believe I have expressed our concern. Obviously, we believe this is a serious issue. We take it very, very seriously, and that's why I look forward to working closely with the NAIC uh, as they review the problem and come up with solutions. And what would your solutions be to them? Because they're sitting here, they've got $100,000 worth of bills trying to figure out how they're going to pay them, and by the way, and counting. I mean, what would your solution be? I'm just curious. I don't have any authority to come up with a solution. I have to act within the jurisdiction that I have under the law and regulations. Mr. Mr. Bilbray. Mr. Murphy. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Ms. Bach. Just to explore the Utah situation and law a, a little bit further, the federal law, as you've stated, gives you authority uh, to step in when a state doesn't comply with the federal standard, which is tied uh, to the constitution of fraud or intentional misrepresentation. Um, and the Utah law, which um, had jurisdiction in the case of the Blizzards, does not have that same federal uh, standard of fraud or misrepresentation. In fact, it allows for the insurer to uh, discontinue a policy simply made on material reliance with or without uh, uh, any intentional misrepresentation. And so it appears, and I know you may not have had the chance to you know, take a look at the Utah law, it certainly appears from our reading um, that there is a clear statutory conflict between the law in Utah um, that controlled in the case of the Blizzards uh, and the federal standard. Um, and so it would seem, you know, given the fact that we have here today at least one example of a state law which stands in direct conflict with the federal law, that maybe a first step might be for the agency to do a review of, there's only 50 states, so it's probably not that hard to go and take a look at all of the different statutes that control here uh, and determine which states, by the very definition of their statutory treatment of this issue, aren't in compliance with the federal law. Does, does that not seem like a reasonable step to take? We actually reviewed all of the state laws right after the enactment of HIPAA to make sure that they were consistent. Uh, and it was the determination of the staff uh, at the then HICFA uh, that uh, they, they were, with a few exceptions, uh, the last state that came into compliance was Missouri which uh, enacted uh, its legislation just recently uh, in the individual market. Uh, what really occurs here is, as I indicated, uh, if there is a situation such as the situation in Utah, and we are very sympathetic to that situation, uh, that could be a red flag, and so we would have to look at the specific circumstances of the specific case to determine that in that specific situation, the state is not substantially enforcing the HIPAA provisions. If we were to make such a determination after an investigation, uh, we would then work with the state uh, to make sure that the state came into compliance, which is the ultimate goal, uh, as a very last resort, if the state failed to come into compliance, uh, we could then uh, assume jurisdiction in that state. And, and, and I, I appreciate that, but looking at the Utah law, I'm just to quote you the law, it's unclear to me how on earth uh, there could have been a determination that this was in compliance. The Utah law says, uh, no misrepresentation or breach of an affirmative warranty affects the insurer's obligations under the policy unless the insurer relies on it and it is material or it is made with the intent to deceive. Uh, and so that or clause allows, I think, insurers in Utah to cancel a policy based on material reliance. Uh, so uh, this is just by way of, of hoping that you, one of the things you will take from this hearing is uh, the chance to go back and re-review the determination that there are 50 states in compliance because at the very least it looks like the Utah policy is, is not. And, and lastly, um, I understand you haven't received complaints into your office, but don't you think there's a, a proactive duty on p the part of your agency to at least be examining the experiences that states have? It wouldn't take much effort for your agency. I understand you're short-staffed, um, and that's a problem that maybe needs to be solved, but it doesn't seem like it would take much effort 
to be in contact with someone like Mr. Lembo or Mr. Bonner on even an irregular basis. And that kind of contact, that kind of solicitation of input from state regulators and state advocates would have discovered, I think, pretty easily that there was a problem here that CMS could have stepped in to uh, address. Shouldn't there be some at least rudimentary proactive in obligation? In fact, that happens, sir. That happens on a regular basis. We talk regularly with state regulators. We meet regularly with them at the quarterly NAIC meetings. That kind of interaction and goes on regularly. And this didn't it, come up in any well, of those discussions? It, 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 it's not that it didn't come up, it's that, remember, our, our uh, jurisdiction kicks in if we have determined or believe that there may be a situation where the state is not substantially enforcing the law, the HIPAA rules. We have no such indication in Connecticut, nor do we have any such indication in California. So. Of course it comes up in discussion, but until and if there is a situation where it appears that there may be circumstances where the state is not substantially enforcing the HIPAA requirements, we have no jurisdiction. And, and, and lastly, Mr. Chairman, just, time is up. Uh, lastly, Mr. Chairman, just to mention, I, I, I do think that that conflict with state laws would, would be immediate evidence that a state isn't enforcing the federal law. And I just would hope that you'd go back and take a look at some of these state laws to make sure that your determinations were correct. Thank you. Ms. Spear. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Block, we all work for the taxpayers of this country. Uh, and I, they expect us to respond. Now, you have a minimum of $400,000 of taxpayer funds in four people that are supposed to be doing something to make sure that the laws of the state and the country are being enforced. Now, your comment to us was, well, you saw no problems in Connecticut or California, so you haven't taken any action. Let's talk about some cases that may not have been brought to you specifically, but were brought to you in the media. In December of 2007, USA Today uh, wrote an article in which they talked about a woman's insurance policy being canceled after she had had emergency surgery for a perforated ulcer. And it was canceled by her insurer because she was having heavy, the only thing she disclosed on her uh, application was that she was having heavy menstrual periods, a condition her doctor said was normal for a woman her age. So based on the fact that she was having heavy menstrual periods, her insurer canceled her. It was national media. What action did you take in that case? I had no indication that the state had failed to take action. I don't know that the individual had exhausted their state remedies. I can't really act simply on information which is never full and complete in a news media report. If that case was brought to my attention, I would be happy to look into it and see whether appropriate steps needed to be taken. I don't even know what state uh, that uh, incident occurred. Well, in. let's, let's talk about another case. Uh, this is a case in South Carolina where a policyholder received a $15 million verdict following an illegal rescission. The case disclosed an array of abusive practices. For example, the insurer's computer system was pre programmed to trigger automatic fraud investigations based on billing codes. The insurer then rescinded coverage based upon an erroneous date written on a single form. Did you take any action in the South Carolina case? With all due respect, ma'am, I do not regulate the individual insurance market. No, we understand that. But you the, do the, have the, authority the over state, HIPAA. No, the state apparently appropriate action was taken in that case. You just said uh, that the person uh, received uh, appropriate uh, compensation. Did you contact the South Carolina? Carolina regulators to determine whether or not they had taken action against insurers in this case? It is not my responsibility to do that. It is my responsibility only to determine if, in fact, a state is substantially enforcing HIPAA rules if a case is brought to my attention. If it, if it's, with all due respect, if it is in the national media, it is brought to your attention. And if you don't believe that that's brought to your attention if something appears in the national media, then there's about $400,000 we can cut from the budget right now. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Block, I just have one question for you. I want to just pick up on what Ms. Spear just asked you. Um, there's an expectation of the people of this country that government is working for them, not against them. And um, they pay us to solve their problems. And they have one life to live. This is no dress rehearsal and this is their life. And I just have one question for you. If right this second, Mr. and Mrs. Blazard wrote on a piece of paper, Dear Mrs. Block, um, we believe that the state of Utah has not done what it's supposed to do in this regard. Would that trigger an investigation from you? That's all I want to know. That certainly could trigger an investigation. No, I didn't say could. I said would it. I would now, we're talking about investigation now. I didn't say conclusion. Investigation. Because they're sitting here right now and they want to know that their government is working for them. And you just sat here and said you needed a complaint. And I'm asking you, these are just regular everyday citizens who paid their premiums, who did everything they were supposed to do, and they feel like they have been cheated. And I'm asking you if right now, if they scribbled on a piece of paper those words, would that trigger an investigation? That would certainly trigger my looking into the situation to determine whether the circumstances in that particular case in fact triggered an investigation. If they would like to make such a request, uh, I would be very happy, you know, to entertain it. Very well. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Bilbray. You know, I don't think it's appropriate to close this discussion without highlighting the fact that contrary to what a lot of people in this city like to believe, the state and local governments are the front line of protection and service to the people of the United States. Washington is not and has never been meant to be. It's meant to be that we end up trying to be, I agree with you, the last line of defense when, uh, when systems break down. But I just, got, I just got to say, as somebody who comes from almost 20 years of local government service, the biggest frustration I had as a mayor, a county supervisor, as an Air Resources member trying to protect the public, was the federal government always thinking that they were the first line rather than the last line. And we just got to understand that there is always going to be times that we can sit in Washington and second guess the men and women that are serving the American people on the front line in cities, counties, and states, and always thinking that we could do it better. History has proven that we can't, we don't do it better. I want to thank the gentleman for his statement. With all due respect, let me just say this, and I will be extremely brief because Mr. Davis uh, has asked me to try to move this hearing along, and I will do that. But so that we'll be clear, Ms. Block, under sworn testimony, said a few moments ago that there were certain things that were under her jurisdiction, number one. Number two, she said there were certain things that would trigger an investigation of those things under her jurisdiction. That's number two. Number three, under her jurisdiction, what she has paid for, what she has sworn is her job. I simply wanted to get some answers to a question of a couple that, by the way, at the beginning of our terms, we raise our hands and swear that we're going to protect the American people. I want to make sure that this couple is protected. I'm not saying the government, federal government can do it better or whatever. I'm just basing that upon the sworn testimony that was given here this morning. Ms. Block, I want to thank you very, very much. And, um, and uh, you are now uh, dismissed. Thank you. Uh, our next witness is Ms. Stephanie W. Kenwood, who is special counsel to the America's Insurance Health Insurance Plans, the Trade Association for the Health Insurance Industry. Ms. Kenwood, am I pronouncing that correct? You are, sir. Oh, Kenwood. Good, Thank good, you. Good. Thank you for asking. Wait, 
you, she will explain the association's uh, policies. And uh, Ms. Canwood, I, I know you just sat down, but I'm going to have to ask you to stand, stand oh, up. Sorry, I should have. Do you how solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Let the record show that the witness has answered uh, in the affirmative. Uh, we will now hear from you. And thank you very much for being with us. Thank you very much, Mr. Cummings and members of the committee. I'm Stephanie Canwit. I'm special counsel for America's health insurance plans. And we represent the 1,300 health insurance plans offering coverage to more than 200 million Americans. Uh, we, I heard Chairman Waxman this morning say that one of the issues, primary issues we're discussing is how to ensure that all Americans have adequate health care coverage. We couldn't agree more. AHIP, my organization believes that all Americans should have access to coverage, and I want to tell you very briefly this morning about two of our proposals for reforming the individual health insurance market, which is what we're talking about. Number one, proposals to ensure that no individual falls through the cracks, and number two, initiatives to give consumers in this market peace of mind, including new consumer protections with regard to rescissions and pre-existing conditions. Just very quickly, my paper summarizes who the, what the individual market covers, who's in it. We believe that there are about 18 million people in there. Uh, our, we just took a survey in December of 07, so it's very recent. We found that the individual market is both available and affordable, that 89% of applicants who apply uh, and go through the process are offered coverage, and the majority at either standard or even preferred rates. But we want to go further. We've heard some disturbing testimony this morning on rescissions and some very articulate testimony from the Connecticut and California regulators. We know that rescissions are exceedingly rare. Our statistics say that it's two-tenths of one percent of policies, two-tenths of one percent. We want to make them rarer still. We want to make them extinct. First. Rescission would not be an issue at all if universal coverage existed. So we have proposed just recently a strategy for individual market reform that would guarantee access to health care coverage. That plan would be a public-private cooperative adventure. It would have states create what we call guarantee access plans to provide coverage for those insured with those who are uninsured with the highest medical costs. And our plans correlatively would do their parts with a coverage safety net and, a guarantee, and guarantee coverage to all applicants who aren't eligible for the guarantee access plans, and there'd be capped premiums on that. Second, and very critically, our board of directors last year recommended important initiatives to enhance peace of mind to those in the individual market. We've outlined in our testimony in great detail the numerous consumer-centric practices we're advocating. And chief among them, and the one that I'm most proud of, is, an, is the uh, position that legislative drafting of uh, uh, which states can use to enact legislation to provide consumers, like the consumers we heard testify this morning, with access to independent third-party review, third-party review, which would resolve any disputes about medical issues related to not only rescissions, but also pre-existing condition exclusions. And our policy, our proposal, goes even further than Connecticut's because it would be independent of the health plan and it would uh, involve both a medical professional and an attorney who's expert on the air in the, that particular area. And any decision, any decision, and this is critical, would be binding on the health plan. The other key initiative that we set forth in our testimony, a number of principles, I made them seven separate principles about rescissions. We believe that the health plans have very serious responsibilities. First of all, they should take responsibilities, and you heard this reiterate some of the testimony this morning, for conducting a thorough, thorough review of questions asked in an application. And if a plan failed to conduct that thorough review of unclear, unclear or questionable information and failed to seek additional information, then the health plan cannot use that information as a basis for rescinding coverage. Just quickly on a final note, we are trying to come, our association is trying to come up with policy solutions that work, both immediately and in the long term. 
Our proposals, which we've detailed in the testimony, take account of state reform efforts over the last 15 years. They were very well intentioned, but we cited a report we just did last year by Milliman, which found that even these well-intentioned state efforts at reform in the individual market, and I'm talking about guarantee issue without a requirement for individual coverage or community rating, had negative consequences for consumers. Higher premiums, decline in enrollment, and often, and unfortunately, an exodus of health insurers from the market. I'm happy to take any questions this morning. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, Ms. Kenwood, you've heard uh, the testimony earlier, right? Have you been here? I did, sir. I've been here all morning. And probably all of those insurance companies are part of your association, the ones that you heard, heard mentioned? I, I believe so, yes. And as I listened to your testimony, um, it was quite impressive. And you were talking about things that um, you all would propose. Um, and I'm just curious, um, why haven't you all done some of those things? I mean, you, some of these things, you don't need us. Uh, my friends on the, uh, constantly say in the Congress, that if, if they can do it in private industry, let private industry do it. And I've got a couple sitting behind you who's facing $100,000 plus in bills and counting after having paid their premiums. And I'm sure they're saying, well, that all sounds nice. But what about um, us? I mean, we, and, yeah, you follow what I'm saying? I do. So why haven't your your uh, folks done this before. I mean, this, this sounds good. And it sounds like this is something that's been on the drawing board, most of these things for a while, or are these things that just came up? Uh, when did you all come up with these? Our, our board, sir, came up with this last uh, December. We publicized this material last December, and it's been an issue that's been discussed for a while. Mm -hmm. We're also, as you heard this morning about the NAIC, we're working with them as well on proposals here. And so when do you anticipate some of these things to go into effect? Because the people are watching us on television, and I know that you said it's only a very minuscule number of people that may be affected by this, but those people are in pain. Those people are suffering just like this couple is suffering, and, and we have faces to put with the failure to institute these policies, and I'm just curious, when do you anticipate that's going to happen? Well, we hope or, or any of them. We, we hope to make, again, the, the, what happened to the Beasleys this morning, for example, a never event. Uh, we are, some of our health plans, for example, have already instituted these policies in terms of the underwriting standards, but we are also working with the state legislatures to implement the issue that I talked about, the third party review, which would obviate a lot of the problems in this area. Um, it has worked in medical, the medical field, having external review, and this would be third-party review for rescissions and pre-existing conditions. Now, the reason that the insurer gave for rescinding the policy that was uh, that Mr. Uh, that the husband Keith had is that he failed to provide information in the application about his medical history relating to his back. You heard that testimony. Yet the relevant section of the application was filled in by Keith's insurance agent whom Heidi testified at complete knowledge of the medical history. And in any event, the medical history of Keith's back has, a, has absolutely nothing to do with Heidi's horrific mountain biking accident, exactly the kind of catastrophic event that health insurance is supposed, and I'm sure you would agree, agree to protect policyholders against. And you testified that your industry has new initiatives designed to give consumers peace of mind about their individual health insurance coverage. And I'm, I'm just curious, um, why do you think insurers treat people the way they treated these, these folks? I mean, I'm sure in your discussions you've tried, I mean, in, in, order for, in, in, other, in, in order for you all to get to the recommendations, you had to, I guess, know that these incidents take place. You also needed to know, to even come up with that third party proposal, you had to know that they, there's some problems here. And so why, why is that? Why do you think that is? Because they have their opinion, I'm sure. And, but why, why do you think that is? Well, sir, we're trying to fix it. We want to make sure that what happened to them does not happen again in the future. We're asking affirmatively our member health plans and our board supports this to go back and do thorough upfront underwriting. And if, you, if that underwriting is not done, if that investigation is not done, if there's an unclear question, then the health plan cannot rescind based on that in that information. 
And I'm sure the chair knows that there are, are reasons to do underwriting, but mm -hmm. you don't, you wouldn't need that if we had universal coverage. And so, and so you don't think that any of this thing ha has anything, I'm just curious, not trying to put words in your mouth, has anything to do with money? I can't speak to that, sir. I can't speak to an individual situation. As a lawyer, I try not to opine in an area where I don't know the facts. Mm -hmm. I don't know this, except what I've heard this morning in the testimony, which was very disturbing. I do not know the facts. All right, um, Mr. Davis. Um, Ms. Cameron, thank you very much. I, um, the, the facts of the case we heard this morning that were pretty devastating to whoever was insuring, and I think that's the kind of thing uh, that we don't want happening uh, within the industry. You'd agree with that uh, from the facts that were presented here? I, I agree. We are trying to make it uh, never happen again, a never yeah. event, as, as they would say. Um, you, you think that the proposed external panel review could mitigate harm done in cases like this? Absolutely. I think it absolutely would have. I also want to point out that, that the, uh, they, the Utah couple this morning who testified had they been, their policy been rescinded under our proposal, they would have gone into the guaranteed access plan that we are supporting very strongly here, yeah. where the state and the private plans would get together and assure coverage for every single person so no one falls between yeah. the cracks. I mean, look, there are good insurance companies, there are bad insurance companies, just like good lawyers, bad lawyers, good congressmen, bad, I mean, whatever. But uh, you, have to, you have to take a look at, um, I'm not going to get into names, um, but, I, but I think in those bad situations, uh, getting some kind of instant appeal to an independent panel is the appropriate resolution quickly. And the difficulties with some of the other things suggested today, we're just going to put on an army of investigators and this like doesn't necessarily uh, bring uh, this to any kind of climate, doesn't bring it to a conclusion. Uh, additional policing may be part of what we need. Maybe we need to bring CMS into this. I, that's something we can look at. But ultimately, if you're the consumer out there and you've got an injury uh, and you've got a dispute, you don't want to have to go to court. You know, you don't want to have to go on a continue. Nobody gets anything out of that over the short term. And so that's what intrigues me about this. Now, can this be instituted? You could be instituted voluntarily as a part of policies, but do you suggest we do this legislatively? We're suggesting that we do this, Mr. Davis, by state legislation. Uh, but you're absolutely right, it could be done relatively quickly and expeditiously. And as I said, it's worked in the medical external review area, and it's a variation of that. From an insurer's perspective, is there a difference between rescissions and post-claims underwriting? Yes, there is. There, there are different principles. Post-claims underwriting is a review of the policy after the policy has been issued, which can result in rescissions, but may also result in, for example, uh, additional limitations, pre-existing conditions, or higher premiums. You know, you didn't tell us about your back problem two years ago, and therefore we're going to we're going to issue the policy, but at a slightly higher rate. So they're not quite analogous. So post claims underwriting, you feel, is an appropriate industry practice. Um, I think it's necessary when you have the individual market that we have now. As I said, AHIP and our members and our board would like to uh, make it. Uh, if you had universal coverage, we would work with the states and the federal government to, to consider uh, how we could do guaranteed issue, and you would never need to talk about rescissions or pre-existing conditions. On an earlier panel, um, Mr. Lembo, you heard him stated that associating fraud and rescissions um, is a red herring, that basically he didn't think there was a lot of fraud in this, there was a small uh, bit of this. Do you agree with that statement, or what has been the experience of the industry? Uh, I can't speak for the whole industry, but I used to work for one company in the industry, and there is, there is some fraud. People need to be careful because all consumers are paying for that kind of fraud. And again, with universal coverage, you wouldn't have to, uh, you wouldn't have to worry about that. Does some of this originate with a consumer? Does some, how about the underwriter? Does it exist there sometimes where the underwriter is just interested in selling a policy? and could uh, That could be possible as well, yes. It could go up the chain. All right. Well, I'm, I'm intrigued by this. I hope that, uh, you, you know, we can get more information out on this so that consumers can have some independent appeal in a case like this and not have to, uh, you know, hold the court system to do it. And I appreciate your, your being here today. And I hope that, uh, you know, I, I just hope we can get some resolution of these issues. Uh, my, yes. Following up on the ranking member's question, uh, 
when you have an independent insurance agent writing, a bonded agent, uh, would one of the other reforms be that because that's a bonded agent and the insurance company who works with them could seek reimbursement for their wrongful act, would it be reasonable for uh, claims made against failures by that bonded agent to be paid, in other words, that these two individuals uh, still seated behind you would not find themselves because of a failure of the bonded agent, but rather that person's bond would be where you would seek to get reimbursement. You know, often insurance companies look at themselves as simply a mover of dollars. In, the, in their case, it seems like they were a victim of the gentleman's friend, but somebody who failed to do their job properly. How, do, how would you comment on that on behalf of, if you will, your industry? Uh, that could work because the but the consumer is, is responsible for the statements of an agent, uh, but in a particular situation, you could possibly find some recompense there. Thank How much time expired, um, Mr. Kucinich? Thank you very much for appearing before this committee. Uh, in looking at your prepared remarks, I, I continue to uh, see where you express an interest in, uh, in making sure that no one falls through the cracks of the health care system. H how do you square that with the policies of, uh, with the industry policy of cance canceling people's health care? I mean, if, if you're concerned that they don't fall through the cracks, doesn't the industry's policies basically push people uh, into the cracks? I don't believe so, Mr. Kucinich. Uh, one of our problems is that we, and, and this is a serious problem for all of us, have whatever the number is, 45, 47 million Americans uninsured. We have kind of a patchwork system whereby you heard this morning Ms. Block testify that the, the states have primary authority to regulate under McCarran-Ferguson. The federal government has some authority. Why do you think people don't, don't have insurance? Why is it you're in the insurance business. Why do you think it is people don't have insurance? I think that some of it is cost. I think some of it is that people choose not to buy insurance. We all have to work together to get universal coverage. And, and do you think people don't have insurance because they can't pay for it, that it's uh, unaffordable, that it's not accessible to them? Currently, absolutely. The price and of insurance too high? Do you I, think? As I said, it's cost as well, and that's what it's, our it's, people guarantee. just can't afford it. I mean, it's too high. The industry charges too much, right? Well, the industry charges what the what it needs to pay out in claims for a system which um, a Commonwealth com a Commonwealth Fund just came out with a report this morning that talked about the number of procedures that are done in the United States, what, costly procedures that are not medically what's, uh, useful. What's the profit rate of the of, of the industry of private insurers? I believe, sir, that it's about two percent. Two percent is that uh, uh, two percent reflect audited figures that relate to their uh, their their true costs, or does it reflect after paying? money for salaries to their executives. Th those are the profit figures. What, I, I are, can't there, are there people who run health insurance companies who make millions of dollars a year to run those companies? I believe some of them do, yes. Does that, does that, that includes, that's included in the cost of operations, isn't that correct? So are all the claims right. fees and, and all the medical claims, yes. Now, the neurosurgeon in the hospital uh, and the f physical rehabilitation unit that delivered this care to Heidi that's been talked about, making it possible for her to uh, uh, resume a normal life and even travel to Washington and testify. Um, uh, they delivered excellent care, but yet her insurance policy was rescinded, and uh, Heidi and Keith don't have the savings to pay $100,000 in medical bills, so the providers are left holding the bag. Why, how does the industry justify treating physicians and, and uh, hospitals that way? Well, I, I can't speak for the industry or the particular cases. I mentioned to Mr. Cummings, I don't know all the facts except what I've heard this morning. We do not, we want to make the situation such as that testimony this morning not occur again. Should, they, should insurers be permitted to uh, uh, tell hospitals individuals are covered and then later rescind the coverage and stick the hospital with six-figure bills that are likely not to be paid? 
that should that should not happen and under our proposal no. would not happen. Now in Northeast Ohio, uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, Ms. Canwood, uh, Metro Health has been struggling with enormous growth and a cost of uncompensated care. In 2007, they are left with $10 million in bad debt alone, which does not include uncompensated care. This is a huge financial burden on doctors and hospitals, which happens to uh, you know, but it happens to make money for the insurance industry. I want to know how much of this practice of rescission is costing Metro Health and public hospitals like it. Probably very little, sir, because rescission is so rare. 99.99% I mean, of people do not have their policies, individual policies rescinded. It occurs so infrequently. It's not the bulk of the issues uh, that, that are, are a serious problem under uncompensated care. That's a cost shifting issue that, again, we have to take care of in the American health care system. Well, I look forward to exploring this further because we may have uncovered yet another creative but until now virtually invis invisible way that the insurance industry makes money by denying care. You know, I, I think, uh, Mr. Chairman, that this industry is the problem, not the solution. Other countries have decided to get rid of their for profit insurance industry and leave the care to patients and doctors without insurance companies intervening. They have enjoyed great success in providing coverage for everyone, improving quality of care and saving substantial amounts of money. I would like to, say, I'd like to state that up. H.R. 676 is an important part of that. The U.S. Conference of Mayors supports it, 91 sponsors in the House. Thank you for being here, Ms. Canwood. I hope that in the future we can have a not-for-profit health care system which would make your presence here uh, not necessary. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, the, uh, the amazing thing about this committee is that we have virtually no jurisdiction in this area, uh, but we're asserting ourselves. And perhaps the best reason is that if, if your uh, rep member companies uh, and government and the people fail to resolve this, Mr. Krasinich's uh, bill will become law. That, you know, it is very clear that we, we do have to choose between dealing with the 45, 47 million uninsured, dealing with people who may have pre-existing conditions, but they have to be able to get in, in, insured uh, or they're going to fall not only into personal bankruptcy, but they're going to fall back onto the state anyway. Uh, you know, I for one believe that we have, we have a universal health care system. It is the worst possible universal health care system because what, it's, what it really says is everyone will have insurance, but it will be at the emergency room. As a Californian, and I'm particularly sensitive to the fact that it's very expensive to deliver that care the wrong way rather than the right way. Uh, on the earlier panel that I hoped to have you on at the same time, I asked a series of questions and they, they were probably less tough on the regulators than they will be on you. Uh, the first one would be, why wouldn't it be fair for a state, or if you will, all states, to simply assign to every company based on their percentage in the market cases with pre-existing conditions and essentially either with or without some uh, participation, financial participation of the state, say this is the cost of doing business. You know, as you said, there, there's this two-tenths of one percent. If you got only your fair share of all the high risk at a particular company and everybody took part of that two tenths, uh, wouldn't we effectively cover pre-existing conditions, get people insured, um, and the rest of America or the rest of the state, the 99.8 percent would have a relatively small increase if assigned risk were part of the scheme. And I, and I know you have a, a proposal for a universal health care, but just dealing uh, mm -hmm. with the man and woman behind you who today have no insurance and, in fact, have a widely exposed uh, pre-existing condition that puts them in the worst possible position in their home state. Well, I, I mentioned, uh, Representative Isa, this morning that we had done this Milliman study that talks about some of the state attempts at reform, all these well-intentioned reforms such as guarantee issue, which I believe is what you're referring to right here, that everyone who applied would get insurance. Um, and unfortunately, as I said, the, the uh, data show that those kind of reforms raise prices, drive insurers out of the market and make, it, make insurance less rather than more affordable. Um, one of well, the but, problems... But, but my question sorry. was narrow for a reason. Uh, mm -hmm. 
as a Californian, one out of every nine people there. Now, with due respect to the, the earlier witnesses, that might be true in Utah if Utah were the only state to do it. But to say that, that insurance companies will leave California if California were to enact that, let's say California, Florida, New York, and Texas, I think you'd get to a point where it, you couldn't afford to be in insurance. And more importantly, I, I accept your, your statement that you're going you're gonna to raise prices. But if, in fact, what we're talking about is, is, is a fraction of 1 percent, and not all of them uh, because somebody has, a, has hyper, hypertension or has a bad back or something, not all of them are going to represent large amounts. Some are going to be cr uh, cancer survivors who are in remission but find themselves in a very difficult right. situation. So there will be some. So my question to you is, looking at it as a national, where would your insurance companies go? They wouldn't go. So now the question is, how much would that raise the cost? And, and I'd be more than happy to accept an estimate for the record, uh, because I, I have one or two more quick questions that I, I need to ask. And one of them is, what would be the effect if, in fact, state unemployment insurance became part of that legacy in that when someone lost their job, they would be covered by the state as part of unemployment and then would, in fact, be, come back to you without, without a gap of insurance? Would that, which is not on the books in any state that I know of, but is part of what Governor Schwarzenegger was trying to do in a comprehensive way, and uh, Congresswoman Speer probably knows more about it than I do, uh, having just come from there, would those kinds of things active from large states like California be effective or at least be helpful? Uh, your first question about is raising the cost for just this small percentage, but it's not just a small percentage of people, very small, who have their policies rescinded or canceled or have pre-existing conditions imposed on them. It's all of how do we get the 47 million, the one out of nine Californians, included in the system, which is why we want coverage for all and believe that that's the way to go to keep prices affordable for everyone by a combination of private and, and public funding and uh, our, our guaranteed access proposal works for that. Um, on your workman's comp question, that's a more difficult. Not workman's comp, unemployment insurance. Oh, unemployment, oh, unemployment workman, insurance. Workman's comp should Gentlemen, already be universal. The gentleman's right. time is up. I've been very courteous, um, and I, but I will allow you to answer the question. Well, I don't, to be honest, okay. I don't know the answer to the question because you still have, Mr. Eisen, the, the issue of who's going to pay for uh, insurance for some of those folks who are uh, of moderate means. And that's going to be an issue as well. What we try to do with our guaranteed access plan is have the public-private funding there to make sure that they are all covered. Thank you for your indulgence, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you very much. Mr. Sarbanes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just on the, on the pre-existing condition thing, um, right now there's a lot of employers, I guess, and leaving, leaving sort of the individual versus group insurance distinction aside for a moment, there's a lot of employers who, where, you ha where presumably you have some workers who um, might have moved on to another job but are staying in the job because of a pre-existing condition and understanding that if they move somewhere else, they may not get that covered. Mm -hmm. So the employer that that person is staying with, just for the purposes of keeping their insurance in place, is going to face higher costs that drive up the premiums associated with that plan, whereas if you had a system that was more seamless uh, where people felt they could move without facing this, this uh, situation related to pre-existing condition, in, in theory, across the board, the employers it would come, sort of come out in the wash, right? Does that make sense? Well, it, it would be better for everybody. Yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, our proposal talks, Mr. Sarbanes, about pre-existing conditions and said we would, we're recommending a one-time open enrollment plus the third-party review that I talked about with rescissions to apply to pre-existing conditions as well. And, and by the way, uh, HIPAA provides some protection on that in terms of the um, portability of right. your continuous coverage, of credible, creditable coverage. The continuation of that has has made a huge difference in the market. Let me ask you about uh, again about this this distinction between um, instances where rescission is is uh, pursued when there's evidence that somebody fraudulently or willfully misrepresented information on their application versus a situation where they just made 
um, an innocent mistake because um, I guess California is a state where uh, that requires that there's willful. evidence of willful misrepresentation or fraud uh, in order to justify a rescission, but there's, there's other states that do not approach it that way, right? It, exactly right. Some states have laws that say it's it, it can be a, just a misrepresentation, negligent or otherwise, or omission, whereas a few states say it has to be actual fraud. And as, the, as you heard this morning, California did that with a case called Healy. Right. The proposal that the AHIP has put forward, you know, as part of these principles and so forth, where, where do you all stand on that? Question. Uh, we are not opining on whether it should be fraudulent or whatever. I mean, what we're ultimately hoping is that you don't need rescission at all. Yeah. We want Why wouldn't coverage. You? Why well, wouldn't because you, you if you that? don't need to underwrite, if you have coverage for everyone, if 100% of the market is coverage covered, um, underwriting is never necessary. Underwriting is only necessary when you have a market such as this which is voluntary, and consumers get to choose right. if and when they want to buy health insurance. And it's really not fair to everyone else in the market and everyone else who has to afford premiums if a person can find out he or she needs major medical services right. and then decide to buy a health insurance policy. But why wouldn't you, under the circumstances that currently exist, um, why wouldn't your association want to encourage a practice that uh, only seeks to rescind in circumstances where there's a willful uh, misrepresentation of fraud. We, we, Why wouldn't you take that position? Well, we, we might. We just haven't taken that position no. because we, we really don't go there. We figure that's really up to state insurance law to define the situations. We're more interested in the 20,000 foot policy view of how to make it uh, rare or non-existent. Well, I'd encourage you to, to incorporate that into your policy. I, I don't quite see how the policy can be considered a rigorous one um, without that component uh, to it. And one of the things that you've talked about is that, uh, you know, one way to, to uh, uh, preempt the situation of rescission or, or avoid it is, is to do good thorough review of, pol of, of the initial application, correct? Mm -hmm. Right. So that, so that all the analysis is done there. And um, I would suggest to you that um, it's an incentive to do that, that work on the front end if, uh, if an insurer knows that uh, the only basis for which they can rescind later um, would be willful misrepresentation because you would catch the innocent mistakes, presumably, right? If, right. if you were doing a thorough review mm -hmm. up front. So one of the reasons I'm encouraging you to follow the the example in, in, in the uh, voluntary policy that you're putting forth of states like uh, California who've made it a requirement um, that it's got to be a willful misrepresentation is I think that that actually encourages the insurers to do the upfront work much more diligently and in the absence of that policy they won't do it and we'll be back in the same situation again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me uh, make one correction. Mr. Issa uh, made a statement with regard to the jurisdiction of this committee. And I want to make it clear that under the House rules, this committee has expressed jurisdiction to conduct oversight over virtually any subject under the legislative jurisdiction of the standing House committees. And I just want to make that, that very clear. Um, Ms. Uh, Spear. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Canwit, I was very impressed by your testimony. Thank and you, you obviously um, understand the issue of the uninsured and the importance of, of trying to make it universal in nature. Um, when I chaired the Senate Insurance Committee in California, we had um, from time to time occasion to engage insurers through their trade associations on issues, whether it was health care or a particular a policy that was undertaken by the health insurers that we found to be uh, problematic, that the trade association actually agreed was a problem. And we were able to, on a case-by-case -case basis, actually resolve those issues, working with the trade association. Um, is Regents Blue Cross and Blue Shield one of your uh, members? Yes, it is. All right. I guess I'm going to ask you a very specific question then. Um, having seen it happen in California and happen very successfully, uh, I would like to ask you to use your authority 
um, and the benefit of your trade association to go back to Regents Blue Cross and Blue Shield on behalf of Mr. and Mrs. Blizzard, because by your own testimony here this morning, you have indicated that you think that rescission was wrong and you want to see rescissions become extinct. And clearly, the mountain bike accident that happened to Mrs. Blizzard had nothing to do with that application. And uh, they acted in good faith in filling out that application, and their agent did as well. So I would like to ask you if you would take this case to Regents Blue Cross and attempt to resolve it. Absolutely. We will do that. I thank you very much. Uh, and Ms. Kenwood, uh, you, you set out some principles, in fact, uh, seven principles that you describe as the cornerstone of what we believe are the responsibilities of health plans to ensure consumer-centric rescission practices, end quote. As I understand it, these seven principles were approved by the AHIP uh, board last November. Can you tell us how many of AHIP's 1,300 members have adopted all seven of these principles? And can you tell us how many are planning to adopt these principles? Uh, they were adopted by the board, Mr. Waxman, in, in December. Uh, I don't have figures for you. I would note that of 1,300 members, many of them, the majority, I would guess, do not even write policies in the individual market, so they wouldn't even be relevant to them. Uh, rescission doesn't occur uh, in the group market, by and large, because the group market is not underwritten, so they don't even apply. Um, but I don't have an exact figure for you about who's adopted and who hasn't. I will say that our board of directors uh, made up of the presidents of all of our uh, big member companies have adopted these principles and believe that this is the way to go. Okay. Well, the reason I ask this question is that judging from their actions, it doesn't seem like all your members are on board. Let's take the case of the rescission of Heidi and Keith uh, Blizzard's coverage. Your principle six states that information about a health condition or treatment arising subsequent to the issuance of the policy may not be used as a basis for a proposed rescission. So it's clear to me that the Blazard, Blazard's policy was rescinded because Heidi had a serious mountain biking accident that resulted in medical bills in excess of $100,000. And this accident clearly happened subsequent to the issuance of the policy. So uh, under principle six, it can't be the basis of uh, uh, rescinding the policy, yet the policy was rescinded anyway. I, I thank you very much for your testimony and uh, helping us uh, deal with this understanding deal with this issue, insurance issue, and trying to understand it further. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We've all uh, learned a lot at today's hearing about the abusive practices of some insurance companies which are dropping coverage for sick people just when they need it the most. We've also discovered that there is much we don't know about the nature of these business practices and the scope of this problem throughout the country. It's important this committee find answers to these important questions, and so we will be opening an investigation into the practice of post claims underwriting by private health insurers. I thank you very much, and uh, uh, Mr. Cummings, Mr. Rewrite. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, I'll just I'll be very brief. I, I uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, our newest member, Ms. Spear, for her question. Uh, Mr. Chairman, as I sat here, I could not help but look at the Blazers in the first slight smile that I saw come from them is when Ms. Spear asked the question, would Ms. Kenwood look into their case? And Ms. Kenwood, I, I just want to follow, and I want to thank you, Ms. Spear, for bringing, raising that. I'm hoping that you will look into their case and try to help them. Um, you, behind you are sit, sitting two people who are in pain. You can call it 2 percent. You call it whatever you want to call it. But the fact is, is that they are Americans who are suffering. And we're concerned about the two whatever percent of, of a percent that you're talking about. Because they are the ones who have got to pay the bills. They are the ones who have got to figure out a way out of no way. They are the ones who have got to wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning trying to figure out why did they pay the premiums, but yet and still when trouble comes, the insurance company is not there. And so I know you talked about some things that you all want to do. But I am very pleased to hear that you are going to look into their case. And uh, we're hoping, like you hope, that we won't have to have these hearings in the future and uh, so that we can address these problems up front. And I want to thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. You. Chairman. Thank you, uh, everyone involved. And I uh, do want to uh, uh, welcome Ms. Spear to her very first meeting of our committee. We're delighted you're now a member of this committee. 
And as I pointed out, uh, you, you, you begin your tenure as a member of Congress uh, just a few months ago, but you bring many years of legislative experience to the table from your service as a former counsel to the late Representative Leo Ryan and from your experience in the California State Legislature, which from my own experience is a good training ground for uh, Congress. So we're delighted that you're here. Your commitment to improving health care, protecting privacy, looking out for American consumers is certainly going to be an asset to this committee, and I'm, I know all members are looking forward to working with you. That uh, concludes our hearing for today, and uh, we're going to stand adjourned.